You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's Wednesday. It's time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. As always, I am your host, Ken Reed, here to talk about classic television uh, with a guest using old issues of TV guides as the entryway into our collective past. Uh, this is a very, very fun episode. Uh, my guest is Karen Kilgariff, who you probably know from My Favorite Murder, but she is also a very, very funny stand-up comedian. Uh, she's one of my favorites. Every time I see her perform or I've been lucky enough to perform with her, she always makes me laugh. Uh, she was a writer for Mr. Show, for Ellen has written on a ton of stuff and uh, also had a great podcast called Do You Need a Ride, but uh, really has blown it out of the water with uh, My Favorite Murder. And I've been trying to get Karen on the show since I started the show four and a half years ago. Uh, she's always very, very busy, uh, understandably so, because she's great. But uh, the last time I was out in L.A., she finally had some time to sit down and talk TV. Uh, we blabbed for a long, long time, which I always think is great, uh, and I think you will like as well. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Today's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Karen Kilgariff. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time with me. Karen Kilgariff, how are you? I'm so good. I said, how are you? How are you? How are you? Hey, yeah. hey. We were having a, you said <laughs> woman's earlier, and I said yes. <laughs> We've gotten Brooklyn uh, henchmen. You were uh, yes handing yeah. my uh, yeah 50 <laughs> Street Gang talk. Yeah, the two are like, hey, let's go play some stickball. Hey, outside. come on, Those these guys. women's are everywhere hey. talking with the mouth. Hey, you know my one weakness is horses and women. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, you know, growing up in the Boston area, heard people be like, ah, oh, and then he lost all his money, and then people legitimately been like, horses are women. <gasps> And then it's usually when they're like, ah, oh, hosses. Hosses. It's the you know, the Boston accent is the most mysterious, <laughs> second only to the Philadelphia accent. Ew, water. Ew, ew. <laughs> uh, but the Boston one, you know, John Ennis, who I was on Mr. Show with, yep. has the best character, Aunt Helen. Yeah. And he puts on a house dress and just yells with the thickest Boston accent. And yep. he cracked the code for me when I heard it. What, like, he'd be like, ah, we having fun. Isn't uh, isn't this fun? Laugh, <laughs> yeah, laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's the funniest, best accent. It's really weird. It's it's what's it? It sounds kind of British sometimes. It's weirdly Irish. So like one of the things people always miss is uh the t at the end of stuff. So like they'll go eight. Yeah, it's like a really weird like you're really pushing it out. Yeah, that's how my grandmother's accent was. Was she from Ireland? She yes, she was yeah. from Longford, which is like somewhere near the west southern west coast i believe yeah. H. and she yeah it would be i always think of her when i cut up the um things that hold a six pack of sodas together because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. she used to always cut hers up and go for the boards, for the boards. <laughs> but it's like how do you, the word birds like has an i in it like yep. hers Boids. was boards yeah. boards uh, so crazy. Did you say boards? There's, what uh, are you doing with boards, Grandma? This is totally off topic. Well, it's sort of on topic, but um, one of my favorite things ever is Jack Haley, the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, because he's from Boston and has a huge Boston accent in that movie. Yes. Uh, ridiculously, when he's like, my arms, my heart. <laughs> but uh, Martin Short, who I love, did this really weird special for Showtime. And he did a pastiche of Wizard of Oz and all this stuff called The Man in the Moon. Uh -huh. And he played an anthropomorphic fence that was like <laughs> dancing. And so he goes, if I'm left out in the rain, my boards will warp. <laughs> And he does the exact accent, and I'm sure he has no idea it's a Boston. He's just doing Jack Kelly, but that's my favorite thing to say in a Boston. My boards are war. I also never realized that Jack Haley. It wasn't just a Boston accent, but it was that soft spoken, which is not a common Boston right. play. It's an old man play. It's yes. before everyone. What happened, I think, in theory, was all the fight in Southeast just procreated, yeah, and all the all the guys who were kind of sensitive <laughs> just never never managed to find the right girl. 
Well, the dancers. <laughs> yeah. They never found the right lady. There's one guy who's an expert on Antiques Roadshow <laughs> who's a big, huge guy with a weird mustache and a ponytail, and he's the expert on like antique jewelry. And so he's always like, oh, yeah, this is a real nice piece. <laughs> He's just, he has that accent. Oh, this is from the Ming Dynasty. That's oh, beautiful. Oh, what a it's nice great. piece. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's g- the greatest. Because you grew up in the Bay Area, right? I grew up, yeah. Uh, well, born in San Francisco, but grew up 30 miles north up in the oh. basically dairy yeah. area so of Is Northern there an California. accent up there? Um, we used to do... So people have accused me of having a California accent, which I think is me just copying my cousin Julie, who we okay. all worshipped. Thought she was the closest. She just had really flat A's all the time. Okay. So she's like, that's her California accent was like, Dad... We need to go to the mall. Right. Everything very, was kind of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to me, California doesn't have an accent. It it definitely does around here, especially when we've been in like places with like working people. Oh yeah. There's that sort of like board shorts accent. Yeah. <laughs> like no, they like take it out of your out of your paycheck, and there's like four days, but they make you pay taxes. Yes. And like that kind of thing is. But I, I think that's a recent like '80s Valley Girl st- cultural accent. Yeah. Whereas my uh, great aunts, um, all the relatives that I have that grew up in San Francisco, um, like in the '30s and '40s, they all had accents that were very much like Brooklyn accents. Because they came from the old neighborhood. Yeah, so yeah. they had. That's exact. They were a little bit like ah, my aunt Anne and my aunt May. Ah, May. They all kind of talk like this a little bit. Back east. Yeah, yeah. it was. A, it was all kind of. My aunt May used to have. A, she used to make great apple pies, and she would give my dad all her secrets. And my dad does it all anytime he makes an apple pie because he goes. You know what you need to do? You stick your finger in the middle. <laughs> That's a woman from San Francisco, and that was her accent. You need to say it that way, or it won't be the same. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you stick your finger in the middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> uh, there's also that, I think part of that is um, age. Like, there's a certain age of people that had that weird mid Atlantic accent, which is like Raquel Welch, Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. Like, that it's, it's sort of that, but just strange. And it sort of melds into the Jan Brady accent. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> sort of a breathless like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, also it is a weird thing. I thought you were going to say it's like even earlier than that that Catherine Hepburn accent. Oh yeah. Oh, where well, is that? Know. But that's that's New England, right? Yeah, that's New England. So it's it's funny how the New England accents changed a lot too because you did have that old man accent where like all our grandparents would be like get some bottles, go down to Feline's and get a I got a lovely blueberry top. And it, no one talks like that now because now it's more like the Southie kind of like fucking kid. Yeah. It's so fucking queer. <laughs> and it's like the weirdest it's, thing. It's, it's the like, uh, yeah. Wahlbergization yes. of, of our culture. And I so hope that someday it comes out that they're putting some sort of chemical in Wahlburgers <laughs> and they all go to prison <laughs> because I know they're up to no good. And I also, they're the, the prime example that if you have more than four kids in a family, one of them will be a chef. Yes, that's right. you know why because one of them will be a drug addict, that's true. And, the, and that's the second as we were talking about before the heightening of, yep. of being a drug addict is you go to chef. Yep, or or into hair. Hairdressing yes. is a big one too. True, true, true. And I learned that from Tabitha Takes Over, a show I can't stop watching. Have you uh, seen that? I have friends who worked on one season of that show i imagine it was a nightmare nightmare beyond like the stories they would tell it was it was hilarious but they were like miserable they yeah. and I, and also they kept telling me these stories and i was like now does tabitha understand that she's not famous like yeah. that this is a pretty much one alley that she's gonna go down people know gordon ramsay yes exactly. they don't know who she is right you can be a dick all you want if you're if you're like the famous british dick but yeah. if you're just some elf looking lady that's rude yeah. You know. Have you seen the the episodes where she really takes a liking to one of the girls? <laughs> <laughs> that happens because she she hates everybody, right? Yeah. And there's one actually in Boston where she's like, "I'm taking you shopping," and she takes this like dumb, cute girl, <laughs> and she has no idea that Tabitha is a lesbian somehow, <laughs> and takes her shopping, gives her like a makeover, and it's the weirdest because it's not like she does that every episode. No, because isn't she supposed to be redoing the hair salon? Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> That's this, inappropriate. Yeah. And she's like totally just hanging out with this one. It happens in like maybe two episodes. She's like, I would just like to get a couple first dates in on my own yeah. show just yeah. to see if I can solidify it. Because you won't notice and then I'll have you. <laughs> <laughs> like she's making like a new apprentice. Yes. It's a yeah. perfect story arc for a hair salon re-renovation show. Yeah. yeah. It becomes also a dating show. Some romance. It's people just don't know until they're married. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Going back to the just for one moment going back to the um, uh, Wizard of Oz. Yes. The other night I was watching that Judy Garland movie, The Something Girls. Oh, yes, yes, yes. About the showgirls? Yes. Yeah. Um, Mickey it, Rooney in that one? Uh, no. It's like they're out in the Old West and then there's they're basically the, the fancy ladies that come to kind of like give competition to the straight up whores right who was and um but it's the classy re- whores. It, the classy whores. but it's re- it's a great movie it's the i'll remember it at the end but anyway ray bolger the scarecrow is in it yes who's also from boston is he really he's from dorchester he's from the same neighborhood as john ennis <laughs> oh really yeah in john ennis the neighborhood where john grew up there's a mural of ray bolger on this like youth center which is hilarious because it's a very black neighborhood now <laughs> and so there's like kids outside freestyle rapping and there's all graffiti and then just ray bolger like <laughs> <laughs> the original gangster. Yeah. Um, well, in that movie, he does these dance routines that are incredible. Yeah. Like, I've never seen anything like it. And I don't understand why that guy isn't as famous as a Fred Astaire. Yeah. Like, it was the, he, like, he just had a dance solo that lasted five full minutes that I couldn't take my eyes off of. Yeah, even in Wizard of Oz, he does some pretty amazing dance stuff. Yeah. There's also, have you ever seen Hell's a Poppin'? No. Oh, Hell's a Poppins, one of my favorite old movies. It's um this this comedy duo no one cares about called Chicken Olsen. <laughs> and they did the show called Hell's a Poppin on Broadway for years and years. And it, it was really weird. It was known for like breaking the fourth wall and like just doing bizarre things. And the movie is about them making a movie of the play. <laughs> and it's really bizarre and really funny and modern. But in the middle, for no apparent reason, these black people come in, which is really weird because it's like the 30s. And they do this like swing dance jitterbug thing that is the most amazing dance sequence I've ever seen on film. Wow. And I'm like, how did they not kill each other like 7,000 times in this because they're like... Oh, the throwing? The- oh my God, yes. yeah. yeah. And then the, then there's like another huge dance sequence and I'm like, why isn't this movie cited all the time as for just this footage? And no one ever mentions it. It's- I wonder, was it because it was from but like the before... What do they call that? The before pre-code the law? Yeah, the, it was yeah. a pre-code one where it, they were had integration Yes, yeah, so you could actually show that. It might be. There's one... It's such a dumb vaudeville joke, but there's a joke in there where checks on the phone and he goes that's good well that's bad well that's good that and he's doing it forever and they go what are you doing he goes i was helping him pick strawberries <laughs> <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing like, that shouldn't make me laugh but it's really funny that's amazing yeah yeah i love that there's such weird like it, it, it's so bizarre and then it ends with them like deciding they're not going to make the movie and, like talking to the audience and it's just really weird uh, why have i never heard of those people oh before? You, they just disappeared the only thing they did after that was they're in i think they're in it's a mad 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 world for like a second mm. and they would show up randomly and like weird stuff but they're just lost to time for some weird reason because they were visionaries <laughs> they were visionaries they people were couldn't like, handle it they were ahead of their time they might have been drug addicts i don't know <laughs> you look <laughs> you know pot had something to do with Both that chefs. <laughs> yeah oh yeah they, they opened a restaurant it's called tj Fridays. <laughs> they, 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 they you know them it. yeah you've heard of it you just don't know you know though. it was called chicken olsen's tgf <laughs> yeah but that uh that Wahlberg, oh boy yeah. I've, I've eaten there i gave him the benefit of the doubt not good no, no. what's it like is it like a tgi fridays it's like a if you it, it's if you went to a five guys and took out all the charm <laughs> and uh, <laughs> took out all the peanut shells yeah, all the peanut shells <laughs> which a guy i work with his he has a son and a daughter and his son is deathly allergic to peanuts oh. and so his daughter always wants to go to five guys because <laughs> his son can't go <laughs> i'm like that's clever i uh, mean cool, but it's one way to get yeah, away from your sibling yeah but it's like that but then also kind of mixed with like an airport <laughs> like it has this weird sort of clinical and it's not great and it's expensive and uh yeah. well it seems like it is made like they said we're gonna make our own hard rock cafe yeah which is not the way to start a culinary endeavor, no, I would the, say. I think the model cafe taught us that 
Yeah. <laughs> How many of these cafes have shut down? Yes, Almost yes. all of them. Planet Hollywood, are there any of those left? I don't think so. I went to the Planet Hollywood in Times Square with my friend Paige one time when we were we were working in New York. It was a miserable job and we were just like, let's just eat. It's there. Yeah. Let's let's eat there for dinner. And it was bizarre and there were people truly enjoying themselves and like standing in line to be there. It was so it. crazy. I've uh, I've every so often I'll get like a gig at like a hard rock cafe weirdly and it's always terrible yes. but i'll just be walking around and be like what is the purpose of this like yeah. it's not even things from this city like it'll just be whatever the warehouse shipped them to put on the walls yeah it's whoever agreed to give them a guitar where you're like well i could pretend to be excited about the bass player from hall and oats as ba- yeah. bass but like he wasn't even hall or oats no I mean, I mean, I don't know if it, they might have seen it. They <laughs> they rehearsed <laughs> near it. Yeah, <clears throat> this was touched by John Oates. Has there? <laughs> I'm not a snob though. I do love a chain restaurant. I do too. Applebee's. I'm never n- unhappy at Applebee's. Their chicken fingers, wonderful. How about those pretzel sticks yeah. with the cheese sauce? Yeah, you can do a chain restaurant well. Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's. I don't think it's the chain restaurant that's the problem. It's the theme restaurant that's the problem. That's exactly like, right. Have you ever been to a good theme restaurant? Good distinction. No, because. They put so much energy into that theme that yeah. everything else is like from Costco. Food suffers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I also hate when you do a comedy club and they like have themed foods. Like it's like the yuck yuck burger. <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, something like that. It's like, I don't think you should do that. You know what's funny though? They at the Improv, which always just had plain food. They they got a new chef, or I don't know what they are doing because they have this kind of new restaurant area. They redid the bar area, okay. so it's now it's kind of a cool place to hang out. And we did a show there the other night, and then people ordered food after, and everyone's like, "This is amazing!" And I was like, <laughs> "So sorry." So the Improv is going into like cuisine now, yeah. like trying to make good food for people. We don't even like comedy. We came for the food, and then we just <laughs> happened to see the show, and it was great. We're actually very irritated by this comedian, but the yeah. burger is amazing. We're trying to eat these pizza wings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Please if pizza wings exist, but I would like them pizza too. Pizza wings sound like the best idea of all time. Would they be more pizza or more wing like? I feel to me, since wings is second, I feel like they would be wings with like melted cheese yep. and pepperoni on them. Yeah, I'm into that. Or something, right? Yeah. I think pizza wings is a new franchise we could start and make a ton of money. I think so too. Because yeah. you can just do that. If you come up with the concept, you just sell it to somebody and then they do it. I feel like everybody falls for combo the combo deal where yes. it's like, do you like pretzels? Well, do you also like pesto yeah ha- try our new pesto pretzel where people are like i have to i love both things it's called prestos yeah <laughs> you'll eat it so fast well i always prestos. call that uh, a futon it's not a great bed and it's not a great couch oh. it's the worst of both yes <laughs> it's like hey but if we combine them it'll be twice as bad and you're combining them for the same reason that you're into that terrible food which is like pure laziness and being gross yeah. i did put a futon in my tv room for a little while and i realized that I just was sleeping in front of a TV. Yeah. It was like, then why don't you just put the TV in the bedroom? Because it's the same thing. Because it wouldn't be like if you had a, I think a pull-out couch is respectable. Yes. Because that requires a little bit of work. Because like, I feel like a futon, you could fool yourself and be like, it accidentally just fell down and yeah. I fell asleep. It's broken. Yeah. But the, you're taking cushions off. Yes. You're pulling a thing out. <laughs> you, yeah. You're basically making yourself a hospital bed. <laughs> yeah. So like, then you have to cop to it. I used to, we had a pull-out couch when I was growing up and I don't know why. Actually, as an adult, I think it's because we we would end up having a lot of my parents' friends and my uncles would like sleep things off at my house. Mm-hmm. Now I remember in hindsight, but yeah. it didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> and uh, I loved though because if you took the bed out, you had this like like clubhouse yes. in the in the carcass of the couch. Yeah, hang out in there. And there's a big space underneath. Yeah. There is a really amazing book. Um, and it's called The Edible Woman. And I'm pretty sure... Do you know that it's no. um, the Canadian woman who writes all the good books? Oh, um... I, I Shit, I'm Someone's g- yelling my in brain their car is, at the My brain is right going yeah. so badly. It's... I don't remember we'll her think name. Of it. Starts with a J. Right? Uh, anyway. Um, the Handmaid's Tale woman. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Margaret Atwood. Yes, Margaret Atwood. 
I'm almost positive she wrote this book. But anyway, I know it's called The Edible Woman. It's basically, a, it's about a, an anorexic woman, but you don't know that. So as you read it, you just think you have this reliable narrator that's telling you stuff that she's doing. And you kind of don't catch on, or at least I didn't, for right. like half the book, that she's completely insane and starving to death. And so the way she's interpreting the world is completely off. And until there's this one point where she goes on a date with this guy she's dating that she doesn't really like and she's they go to his friend's house so there's two couples in an apartment and the and the other three people go into the kitchen to like make drinks or something and she decides she wants to get down inside the couch <laughs> and so she does it and when they come back they don't know where she is and she can hear them talking about her it is the most amazing and she's talking about like she's describing like how there's like burlapy material yeah, yeah. and it's kind of like dusty and she yep. can't breathe that well, but she's in the, she feels really safe and comfortable. And then at one point they've realized she's in the couch and they're like, you have to get out of there. And so she gets out and just fucking runs away. I'm never talking to these people again. <laughs> she runs. And when I read it, I was probably <laughs> like 20 or so totally out of my mind myself and yeah. i was like this sounds like the best experience of yeah. all time just do exactly what you want as insane as it is yeah. and then run just run away there's no one's gonna stop you <laughs> yes. it's like it's like real life social media exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i did this was embarrassing um sort of but also I, i'm kind of proud of it was i was talking to someone about how great it was when you were a kid if your mom dragged you shopping which my mother always did yeah and you'd get inside the clothes rack yes in the department store in the center and it was like it was like the most zen chilled out place a child could go yes and uh we were at the mall and the store was going out of business and they were selling those racks <laughs> so for like ten dollars so i bought one and rachel's like you're crazy <laughs> and then i set it up in our guest room and put clothes on it and i just kind of sat in there to see if it would still be the same it's not quite the same but yeah yeah i think you need the um extenuating circumstances <laughs> yes. of like a long horrible day at school yep. you know that you're going to be in that store for two more hours God, yeah there's but here's the thing i think do, were you sound sensitive growing up were you the yeah. kind of person that was like a little flinchy little and jumpy. a little yeah, yeah. And, but also you recognize things really quickly yeah, absolutely yeah same here and i think and my niece is the same way and when she was like between one and three years old it drove my sister crazy because she couldn't like um like public bathrooms where the flush was really loud um that would like echo inside the bathroom like my niece would lose her mind and my sister was like she won't go to the bathroom and i'm like no 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 it's she it's yeah. she, her ears are too sensitive yeah and i think going inside of those um rounders is what i used to call them in the in the biz in the biz um <clears throat> every all the sound deadens out that's true and it's like that cloth it's like being in the couch it's yeah. that clothy feeling and it's just kind of like nice and, it, and it's to your point of it has to be kind of in the store yeah there's so much stuff going around and you find this like little weird oasis in there yep uh yeah that, that but it just wasn't quite the same so i need to make that room more chaotic <laughs> I think it's the problem. <laughs> you have to put bring all your problems into that room yep. and then go inside, then go inside the, inside the, rounder. the rounder. I did in this in the Lord and no, it wasn't Lord and Taylor. It was Jordan Marsh uh, in the North Shore Mall. I got trapped in an elevator when I was a kid for hours. <laughs> Shit! How old? Six, maybe. So my sister was still in a high chair. So she must have been two or three. And she, I was like spacing out and. Her and my mother went out of the elevator, and my sister like bashed all the buttons, and then the, and then the elevator went like this and went between the two floors, and I was just stuck. Whoa! And I was like, "This is the worst thing ever," and that wasn't fun. Even though that was like, "Oh, I have a place to myself in here." No, that's different because you don't. It's not your choice. Yes, you can't get out <laughs> if you need to. Now, could you see them like the doors were open enough so that you could they could uh, talk to you? Eventually, no. I, don't, I feel like they just went out to lunch or something because like eventually <laughs> can't some, handle this. Yeah, he'll be fine. He, he's not going to go anywhere. Uh, like some maintenance guy came in and like cracked the door a little. He's like, "Hey, kid, you're gonna be all right, Nick, kid." <sighs> and I was like, "That's that's fine." You were by yourself. Yeah, because they we were the only ones in the elevator, and. <laughs> This is a total weird side note. There's a, a like a reclaimed marble place near my house. And <laughs> we always like to go there because they always have the stories of like where the stuff came from. Like they had the cobblestones from Scully Square, which was like the old red light district in Boston. Yeah. The streets. So we bought a bunch of those and like I have them in a pathway. But 
that Jordan Marsh, the exterior was all this like marble, mid-century marble. And they had it all when the store got torn down. So I got some and made it into steps on my front lawn. And someone was like, wow, you're really mad about that. I'm like, no, this isn't like a revenge thing. Where I'm like, I was trapped in your elevator. Now you're my steps. But it did kind of weirdly seem like I had done that. It's a serious power play with the elevator. Yeah. yeah. You know, one time I trapped an elevator. Now it's my steps. That's what happens. Yeah. That's what happens when you trap me. You don't trap me. And in I'm no six elevator. years old. Yeah. I, have you ever been trapped in an elevator or anything like that? Yes, I was trapped in an elevator when I was in high school and we were in Russia. So oh, I took Jesus. this. I know, it was so crazy. We took this. It was like... Um, were you on the show head of a, cl- head of a class? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> was it a chess tournament? <laughs> it sounds like such a... Um, it First of all, it sounds like a richy rich brag or whatever, but it was like... It was basically our school and another school combined. And the tour was called... It was one of those, you know, summertime high school tours. Yep. And it was called like Russia, Poland, and the West or something. So it was like a week in... Moscow and around and then we went to Poland and then we basically came up and did the fastest like one day every country (laughs) that you wanted to go to (laughs) yes exactly like West Germany France England and we're gone but the Russia part like we flew in on Aeroflot which is the most insane I mean we thought we were going to die every time we got in a plane in Russia (laughs) it was so it's so shaky and loud and crazy Um, but in one of the hotels that we were in it was me and my friend and then two girls from the other school and a mom from the other school. And we didn't really mix that much with the other school because yeah, they're, they're the other school. Yeah. And we all we got stuck in this elevator and I was in my mind, I was just like, yeah, because nothing, everything here is so fucking rickety. And it's all from like 1930. It was actually just probably some guy pulling it and he went on lunch. (laughs) (laughs) A a big Lennon mustache. (laughs) Wearing one of those strongman suits. (laughs) Yes. (sighs) Just, oh. Um, The mother that was with us began to lose her shit. And I. Oh, that as a kid, that's the worst. It's the worst, but I was, we were 16. So I remember this thing clicking in me, and it was basically my mom's personality taking over, where I turned to her and I was like, stop yelling. That's not helping anything. I like completely became the adult (laughs) because I was like, you're freak. If you say another word, you're going to make me start screaming. Like that's contagious, that kind of panic. And also, they were five people in an elevator. Yeah. They're not going to like leave us here forever. Right. And of course, it started going five minutes later. Yeah. But it was that kind of thing where I just, I, it was it was one of those first teenage moments of don't trust adults. They yeah. don't automatically know. They're fallible and they're scared all the time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. like you're here as an as a, a chaperone on this huge like trip, and this is the first thing that happens. This is what you turn yeah. into. Like get we're the fuck screwed. out of here. Yeah. yeah exactly. We're but it's so funny because that. That's such a classic sitcom trapped in an elevator thing, and it's in every sitcom. Yes, uh, trapped in an elevator, trapped in an elevator, talk literally talking someone off a ledge, mm-hmm. or being on a game show. Um, <laughs> and I always thought it'd be funny if there was a sitcom where, like that, there was a game show where you had to talk someone off a ledge, like from an elevator or something. <laughs> just get it all out of the way in one episode. You're on a ledge, you want to commit suicide, but then you see that someone gets trapped in an right. elevator. You, you have get to help them. Called in. Yeah. Oh my god. And I have a clock uh, for the thing. <laughs> But I know almost nobody that has been trapped in for that long. It's usually no. like a few minutes. Did you watch that video of the guy that gets trapped for the weekend? No. Is it in Japan? I feel like that would be in Japan. I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was in Manhattan, but I can't remember. But basically, just it's it it it's terrible, and it like it, you know. <clears throat> It was, a, I think it was a long weekend. I can't remember what ended up happening because I, some of those stories end really bad. Oh, yeah. Like really horribly. But I remember somebody showing me the videotape and then I was like, oh, I don't want to watch this anymore because this is a person that's like spending hours and hours like trying not to panic. And Solitary then panicking. confinement, yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. I, I, when I worked for a local CBS affiliate in Boston when I was in college, I worked in general services, which meant I like dumped the recycling and took <laughs> audience complaint calls sure uh, the because, fun stuff yeah and um the weather girl was doing like a weekend thing at some school so she wanted to get like some tchotchke things to give to the kids so we had to go up to like this weird supply closet way in the like the bowels of this building and we got locked in and it was i mean it was like a room it wasn't like a closet but we were trapped in there and it was 
Friday on a long weekend, oh, no. and she started freaking out. And I'm like, I don't know, like, and then I was like, does she think I like engineered this? Like, I don't, this is like, oh super yeah. Creepy. <laughs> oh, no. So we're like, what are we gonna do? And um, this guy who I used to work with, who was basically a human Yogi Bear, he was like, hey, Kenny. <laughs> like, that's exactly how he talked. And every time he'd hug people, he'd yell full frontal, which was weird. That is. Um, but um, <laughs> he comes in and he looks in and he goes, oh, you guys trapped in here? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh. and he let us out. And I was like, how did you know to come find us? And he goes, well, I got trapped in there on a long weekend once. So every Friday, I checked to make sure no one's in there. But what happened to him was after a day and a half, he decided he was going to go up through the ceiling. And he fell through and sliced his arm up. Oh, my like, God. Real bad, like because he came through like a bunch of wires and stuff. And then like crawled down to the newsroom and they took him to the hospital. Holy shit. But because of that, he c- came and checked that closet every weekend. And I was like, thank God that you've thank checked this closet. Because that would have been at least four days and oh my then, god yeah. also i feel like if i was him i would have had those doors removed or like yeah. some massive move to like make sure this or never happens protect- again someone's stealing wbz beer koozies <laughs> <laughs> we really need to have what are you some trying good- to protect yeah there's nothing in there that anybody wants yeah we have a bunch of paper hats that yeah really uh, well now they're my paper hats yeah i've claimed them now i, I have I'm- to say though i am the kind of office worker that suddenly does want all the paper hats like yeah. anytime there's a stack of something like i was I was the queen of just having every color post-it note anytime I've yeah. had an office job. I'm like, I need these. I need to take these. Have you ever had the office job where they give you free reign of the catalog? You know, it's funny. <laughs> the first big job that I had when I was when I was the head writer of Ellen, I got to order things for my office out of a catalog. Mm-hmm. And so I went through and was picking like the most expensive fancy things. So I picked like a I picked like a digital clock that also had a barometer on it or something. (laughs) And it makes coffee. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember my boss going, pretend like you're paying for this. And then I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. No. This is a good time to, this isn't, where it's not like we're working for some huge company. This is, we still have a budget. (laughs) Right. It's so embarrassing. But I was like, oh, I thought this was like, we were doing the old on the corporation. Yeah. Yeah. Are we expensing this? Can't I have a quartz? Expensing? (laughs) (laughs) I need quartz in my clock. I need a quartz, just a quartz. I need <laughs> like a huge quartz in here. I need a crystal filled office so yeah. that I can do my job correctly. Have you seen the dark crystal? That's what I want for <laughs> I my want, office. I want all those characters around me. Although you can do that at some studios. Like my friend worked at, at I don't know if all of them do it, but at Paramount, you can go into the warehouse and they put post its on things they want in their office and they bring them and you can have your office that way. And then if they need them, they come take them. But we walked by some guy's office was like a throne room. And some other guy had like literally had Star Trek. Oh like, shit! The Star Trek stuff in there because they're like it's just in the warehouse, so might as well just have it in your office. That's awesome. I was like, and they have people that can fix it if something happens to it. So I'm like, that's probably the best thing ever. Where you're like, I think today my office will be a throne room. I think I'm gonna get the leg lamp from yes. a Christmas story. Christmas story themed <laughs> office. Hey everybody. <laughs> sell it that's fun if you ever um in any of your jobs like been on a studio and been like i want to see like this thing that i know is here well we worked um long long ago uh uh when ellen was on the hollywood squares we were like her specific joke writer nice (laughs) which is hilarious because we didn't it was you couldn't write a hard joke on that show but um we got brought down and we got to see the wheel from The Price is Right. The entire Price is Right set was in the hallway and they would go in and shoot in the same studio. They would go shoot Hollywood Squares like through over the weekend. Right. And, but but all the stuff was there. So you could walk by um, the little... Uh, the mountain climber guy that oh, yeah. falls hey, off the thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like all those games are just sitting in the hallway That's and there crazy. was something I didn't know I cared that much but you walk by that wheel and you're just like I want to spin that wheel. Yeah and you get like weirdly choked up sometimes like I went to the uh, Museum of the Moving Image in Brooklyn or no in Queens and they have all the Muppets Yeah, all of Henson stuff. I walked in and Rolf was there and I like instantly started crying. I'm like, yes. what the hell? What's happening? I, it's a rug. <laughs> <laughs> I auditioned, remember in the late 90s when they had the new Muppet show? Yeah, they Muppets were Tonight? Yes. Yeah. I auditioned for that. I don't know why. I had no skills to be a part of it and had no puppeteering experience. But they were like, oh, just go in. So they were like, go in and there's all these Muppets laying on a table and you got to pick the one you wanted and then the other puppeteer who was a real Muppeteer, picked one, and then you were supposed to like act out a conversation. So it was all the kind of like 
the B B celebrities of the yep. Muppet realm. So it was the blue face guy that ordered the soup from Grover, yep. and it was Prairie Dawn, and it was all these people. Well, I was as starstruck as I've ever been. Yeah. I picked up Prairie Dawn, and he picked up the blue face guy that orders soup, and With the I mustache. Couldn't, that guy yes. Is. And we so you have like the puppet above your head, and you're supposed to be like. You know the stick with the hand, yep. and then you're you opening the and closing the mouth. Uh, no, we were doing it in a okay. mirror. Yeah, but he would go like, "How are you today, Prayer Dawn?" And I would just stare because <gasps> I was just w- looking at two celebrities. Yeah. like I, c- it was the worst audition I ever had. It would be like Cyrano de Bergeracking like George Clooney. Yes, <laughs> you're like say this. Like you're not going to be able to do that. It's Prairie Dawn. Yeah. Like it's all. I mean, I feel like those kinds of early childhood faces. Or like, um, I have a picture on my refrigerator. It's cut out of a magazine of Mr. Rogers' red sweater. Yep. The zip front sweater. I want I want to look at that so bad. I think it's at the Smithsonian, yeah. maybe. And yeah. that's why it was in this magazine. But it is like, when you look at it, I'm like, oh, that's why... Like that's why, like when I go thrift store shopping, I love those sweaters. Yeah, and it, I never knew it. it. It's weird how that stuff in prints, and I and it was every day we saw that stuff, and it was the first. Like I, two things come to mind: is one, um, if you ever fly into the Pittsburgh airport, they have the set from Mister Rogers, the little miniatures that are in the from the beginning. Oh no, it's in a glass case. And no, because he's Pittsburgh based, and I had no idea. And I was walking through, and I was like. <gasps> Like, because you just recognize, and you don't know why you recognize it at first. Yes. It takes you a second. Um, and I was like, oh, my God. But um, when you, you don't realize how much those things are part of your life until it, like, weirdly gets upsetting because you don't have a lot of experience as a kid. Like, when Family Ties ended, I literally had to stay home from school because <laughs> I was so upset. That it was not going to be on TV anymore? Yeah, because it had been on, you know, I, I was, what, eight or nine, and it had been on for, like, seven years. So yeah. it was like, this was on my entire life, and yeah. now it's over. And it was <laughs> so, like, devastating because it was such a part of, like, your every day. It was. It was such a real family, too. And I, I remember when Alex B. Keaton got together with his girlfriend that they were so opposites that they were, like, not friends. Oh, the Tracy Pollen one or yes. the Cri- Cor- Courtney Cox one? Oh, uh, Tracy. Tracy Pollen. Yes. Because he was like going out with his her roommate and then they didn't get along. They were along. engaged and then he drove down to meet her at, and then the, the Billy Vera and the Beaters. The Billy Vera and the Beaters and the bookshelf falls yeah. and the whole thing where it's, it was the most realistic and well-written romantic thing that I had seen. And I was, you know, I was 10 years old, yeah. but I was just like, oh, this is how it happens that people are opposites. Well, what did Can, you, you think? think? Yeah. I was like that. Even, yeah, I was about that age too. And you're like, oh. Being a teenager and it's gonna be great. It's a, <laughs> it's it all that, gonna like, be like yeah, this. It had that like eighties movie romance thing where you're just like, oh man, what a gesture. Yes. And now they're together and they're still married. They're still married. Yeah. Yeah. It it was real. That That's one why was we much liked more it. Real. I think so because the Courtney Cox relationship was forced on that show. Even as a kid, I was like, nah. Yes. She was like, she was a psychologist student, and and it was testing him against a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> It was a big monkey testing phase. Was that before Tracy Pollen? After. Okay. What happened to Tracy Pollen? They, they just, just broke wrote up? her out of the show. Yeah, she mo- went away to college in the show. And I don't know why, because they were still together in real life. I think uh-huh. she just, she kind of stopped acting. So it might have been that she was just like, eh, I'm this, quitting. This sucks. Well, yeah. also, that would have been a huge spike, like just this huge fame arc in her real arc but like a fame experience in her real life maybe she was just like this isn't what i thought it was gonna be it could have been too and i don't know from experience or no one's told me this but i've heard on a lot of shows when people are coupled the producers hate it oh because they want the show to be about somebody dating yes and they get like really like no 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 no, we can't have this because now we don't have this character who can do crazy things or like look stupid on a date but it's true because also i think even though it's not realistic like when joni and chachi finally got together i was like fuck this show yeah, because cares? i love chachi since i was seven years old so sadly yeah so <laughs> block me on twitter <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more disappointing than when I found out that he was just a big dick. Yeah. But as a child, he was just so beautiful and like scratchy voiced and perfect that him loving Joni made you love him more because it was like he was a softy. He sees the best in her and they are in a band together. And he also wasn't like... <laughs> I forgot yeah, about the band. He wasn't like Ted McGinley handsome either. He was no. kind of like, 
the, the cute kid in your neighborhood kind of handsome. Yes, yeah. he was. He was. Well, he started out as like the little boy next door. Yeah. Then he grew into this like insanely gorgeous man. You go from Bugsy Malone to Zapped. Oh, <laughs> Bugsy Malone. I'll tell you, Bugsy Malone was the height of my Scott Bayo like crush where i can barely watch that movie (laughs) because it was so like the idea that he was a little man in a three-piece suit with a gun i was just like i'm i'm this is beyond i can't handle it sings and shoots pies i for some reason i've always found paul williams music terrifying (laughs) i don't know what it is something about where it's all like like it's some kind of weird thing and i think it's because i saw phantom of the paradise like way too young yes i did too but because of that bugsy malone is always unsettled me and there's also that probably the uncanniness of like kids being adults and in like that terror tiny town kind of thing yes where you're like but but actually what's going to happen if like if a fire starts or if someone if they drive a car into a tree they shouldn't be driving like where are the where's the adult supervision yeah, yeah, this is insanity. Yeah, so that always threw me off. But I, I always liked him as an actor, and I met him at a mall once when I was six. He Scott was, Bale? Yeah, he was promoting Charles in Charge. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> it was that three year window when everyone was like, the key to promotion is mall tours. It's yeah, like, the Tiffany yeah, years. Yeah. yeah, and so he went to the came to Liberty Tree Mall, and I have a picture somewhere of me like bear hugging Scott Bayo when uh. I was like six years old. And uh yeah, and then he <laughs> I got into an argument with him on Twitter because he was being super racist. <sighs> and he was like, uh, oh you just was like uh you just think I'm an asshole because I'm conservative. And then I was like, no, you're conservative because you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like he blocked me. Blocked. Yeah. Um but man oh man. Uh he, he was the pinup maybe for like a generation. He was he seemed kind of moody. Like Yes, he wasn't. He was a little dangerous. Yeah. For he started out as like the sweet boy that had this crush on Joni that yeah. you were just like you can rely on him loving Joni. Yeah. But then yeah, he grew into this other thing, and that. But then I think we, my sister and I, both graduated into Matt Dillon. So oh, it was yes. like Scott Bale was your starter kit, but then Matt Dillon came along, Over and then the you're edge. like, yes. Yeah. Then I'm like, I'm ready for this motorcycle shit. Yeah. Goodbye, guy who's devoted to the girl next door. Yep. Now I want danger, my bodyguard, like that whole thing. Who's in SC Hinton movies? Yeah. <laughs> That's who I want to see. I want Dahlia. Yeah. I want the fucking, yeah, yeah. Rumblefish. Everyone. It's funny, there's like, uh, my wife always jokes about this, but in Boston, there's like three looks that dudes have, and it's like Matt Dillon <laughs> is the one, <laughs> yep. like right off the boat, coal shoveling Irish guy. <laughs> But, like, there's variations on Matt Dillon. So, like, Dickie Barrett is in the Matt Dillon category. Yeah. It's just, like, slightly variations. So, like, you can walk through town and be like, Dillon, Dillon, Dillon. <laughs> like, you just go, like, which Irish-looking dude they look like. Yeah. And Matt Dillon is a very popular one. I mean, it makes sense, though, because it's, like, it's the... Um, he was all, like, you know, biceps. He was, like, biceps and sensitivity. Yeah. So, it kind of didn't make sense, and you couldn't trust it. I'm sorry I punched you. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, like, hey, look, you know, there's nothing better to me than the scene from The Outsiders where they're at the drive-ins, but they're in the stands for some reason. And Dally comes up and Cherry turns and goes, get lost, Hood, (laughs) because he won't stop picking up on her. And I love Diane Lane. I love Diane Lane. She's always been the most gorgeous woman. Yeah. I mean, talk about these are like these are these people that have been planted as seeds from the my earliest memories that we totally grew up with, and they grew up in movies. Yeah, and is one of those people too who just aged, and also you're like, and you continue to be stunning. Yes, how is this possible? And I mean, like, it's almost like. I feel like casting people know this where they're like the bone structure. They pick people that were like, you know, when they're casting those children for Harry Potter, they're yeah. like, we are picking these people because of who they'll grow into. Yeah. Like very specifically. But I don't know if they knew that back then. I don't think they did because like all the, all the, not so much with the women, but like the guys, especially all the people I knew who were child actors are really small people now. Yeah. And like, that makes sense because they were like small for their age so they could play younger, younger and yeah. like had a certain look because they were, that, but then like it doesn't, translate to growing into like a handsome person necessarily no not at all um but the slightly less for women probably but i feel like it seems to happen less now that kid actors grow into awkward adults right because they know the time when we were you know. Know. well and also then it was just like then that person would be gone and they would yeah. be introducing like the newest tiger beat guy to right, you right. what i respect matt dylan for having been that guy for literally 40 years yeah 
Yeah. Although I have a, I love off brand teen magazines, and there's one that whenever I find it, it's my favorite. It's called Teen Bag. And it's what? not a joke. It's a real magazine. It started in like the 60s. And um, the first issue I bought, I was, I did a live version of the show, and Amy Sedaris was my guest, and she had like near her apartment was this weird little vintage store, and I found all these Teen Bag magazines. And I showed her, I'm like, this sounds like a made up magazine you would have had on Strangers with Candy. Like, yes. And she's like, oh, it does. Teen Bag. Teen like, Bag. <laughs> like, it's real. And the first issue I found had David's soul on the cover. Yes. But I'm like, what teenager is like, oh, this middle-aged, male pattern baldness, <laughs> like, second stepdad looking guy? Yeah. I mean, they used to force all of those guys. It was like the Adam 12 guys would be oh, in yeah. those. Like, because we, Teen Beat, Tiger Beat. Bop. Yes, all of those. They were like, it was just the thing you got at the grocery store because yeah. it was before the internet, before all those things. So it was like, you know, I loved I loved Scott Baio all week long, but I could only watch Happy Days one, one night a week. Yeah. So you had to get your t- Tiger Beats and your Team Beats to be like, what does Scott do on the weekends? What would he say to you if he What's met you? favorite ice cream? It's seriously, yeah. then you'd just be like yeah. memorizing information that was probably a lie. But they would, it was just a PR thing of like, here's the newest show yeah so now here's i remember like ted mcginley would be in those or, or people from the love boat or whatever it be, and they or leaf garrett who yeah. like leaf garrett you as only a certain kind of girl liked leaf garrett he always seemed like he was always out of was in the wrong time yes like he was still kind of looking 70s and it was like no we like duran duran now like yes. it was like not- he kept the robert plant thing going for yeah. a really long time Button a shirt man yeah <laughs> we don't need this <laughs> buttons are oppressive <laughs> i don't think i've ever seen him with a shirt buttoned even no. now no 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 he needed this part yeah. had to be open you know what's super funny i i loved i switched hard from scott Bale and matt dillon my sister had the matt dillon track she yep. took the matt dillon track and when the outsiders came out i went full on um i was gonna say se hinton Did you go swayze crazy <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no uh c thomas howell oh, okay um because he was so young and sweet yeah. and innocent and trying to be good and it, but from the wrong side of the tracks yeah. and all that stuff and i i would do things where i would think in my head like we'd be going to the beach for the weekend and i'd be like but get ready just in case c thomas howell is at the beach <laughs> Like it became this yeah. bizarre obsession of prepare yourself for the day that you meet. You see Thomas. Me- have you met him? No, but we went to see. Um, this was easily ten years ago. But we went to see Red Dawn at yeah. the um, the that theater in Santa Monica. Oh yeah, um, that's the, on, on Third Ave. Yeah, the yeah yeah, yeah that's the right promenade. There. Yeah yeah. Um, no no, it's the one that's on Santa Monica right oh, by yeah, the yeah. freeway. Okay yep. The it doesn't matter. But Red anyway. Dawn, which has the most offensive anal rape joke in it. <gasps> Does it really? Yeah, it's it only hit me later in life where um sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Um they're like uh Leah Thompson has just been captured by the Russians and they like f- like freed her. Yeah. And she's all like catatonic and she shows up and one of them goes what got up your ass and she starts crying and then they go that was the wrong thing to say oh, no. and i was like i was like what why is this in the movie i did not remember that at all i couldn't like i actually rewind I'm like ah, surely that's not what i heard and i'm like nope yep john millis must have stuck that in there for no apparent reason surely this cannot be yeah oh shit well but did he show up at the screen? He showed up, and I we were there. Couldn't have looked grosser. Big sweatshirt, <laughs> just like we were. We had all gotten high in the car beforehand. We were sitting there, and after the movie ended, they're like, "And and here's a surprise guest. It's C. Thomas Howell. He stands up. He's like three rows in front of us, and he stands up and just starts telling stories about how much he hated Patrick Swayze and how much Patrick Swayze hated him. And it was like the most amazing thirty minutes of my life. I love him so much now, like more than I. Ever did yeah. as a child he he was i always wondered kind of what happened to him because he like the hitcher is one of my favorite movies ever it's amazing uh, the movie's so good and horrifying and absolutely rucker howard's terror like the first 10 minutes of that movie are some of the most gripping 10 minutes of anything ever it's so good and then that line where he's just like what do you want and he's like i want you to stop me yeah. <laughs> like, this is amazing um <laughs> uh, and see john was how so good in it um and then he just kind of disappeared and then was popping up in like erotic thrillers and like yeah. i'm a cop who fights vampires kind of movies 
<laughs> where he had like a goatee and stuff. And I'm like, what? Did you ever see him in Southland though? Yes, yes. Because that when he came back for Southland, it was like the perfect casting. You finally saw him. I think it was like he played the sweet boy for so long that he got a little lost. Yeah. And then it was like, yeah, because you're not the sweet boy. You're kind of a dick. Yeah. And you should do that. And it's so believable. And then it was just this explosion of like, it made me very proud to yeah, see that him he's, in Southland. He's he, um, I, I saw him in person when he was shooting Soul Man oh. in Boston. They shot it in Cambridge because it's supposed to be Harvard. And <laughs> I uh, saw it in the theater. Did you? I did too. Oh, yeah. yeah, I did too because I was like, they filmed it here. Let's see if we <laughs> see where they filmed. And there's a scene that still bothers me because there's this uh, iconic, it's called the Yellow House in Harvard Square. And um, they're driving, but they're just doing a circle. Yeah. So they keep passing this house. <laughs> and it and like 40 times in this one scene with him and Ari Gross. Is it Ari Gross? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm just like, oh, this is not what that's like there. <laughs> but yeah, that's I, that movie, uh, people don't like that movie. That movie is so old and ill-conceived <laughs> yes. in, in the way of talk about like white only experience yes. where just the the idea that somebody having a black experience would be this like foreign insane thing yeah and and really the only like the couple experiences that he has first of all Ray Don Chong who is not that black no that used to drive me crazy is like they would cast these black women who are the lightest skinned yeah. black women where it's just like how about he goes and actually learns Stacey a lesson Dash. from re- yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. she like, has blue eyes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but remember that time where the, there's the part where he tries to go in and be like militaristic and yes. like go, that scene it's where like he a Black Panther. In. Yeah, I remember that's the moment in the movie where I went, they shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, as like a 12 year old, I was like, yeah, this doesn't feel right. Even I did too in Boston. <laughs> like it reminded me of whenever I would see like a body switching movie, uh, it would always hit me like the adult would be acting too much like a young kid. Like he's supposed to be 13 and he's like being like a baby. Yeah, and I had that same kind of reaction there where I was like. That's not how. No. No. And they, but they don't play it like everyone's like, "What are you doing?" Right. It's just like he's got it now. Yeah, he's completely <laughs> believable, and it's yeah, just the the whole thing feels it's, terrible. I still can't believe that movie was made, um, and it you can still watch it. It hasn't been erased <laughs> from history. They, they didn't collect up all the copies and burn <laughs> no, them. No, they they really should. I knew a guy who there was a a, a white power. Um, skinhead band called Screwdriver. Oh. And I knew this guy who used to have, like, really liked them. Mm. Um, and there was always, like, a... like a Was it Adolf Hitler? His name was Adolf. And that <laughs> little boy grew up to be... Um, but it, there was always this ridiculous thing where, like, people in punk rock bands would be like, well, I like the first record before they're racist. Right. And I'm like, no, they're always racist. They just started singing about it. But this guy, uh, who's a fairly famous guy, I won't out him, but he used to swear up and down that the only reason he bought those records was to get them off the streets. <laughs> and he'd be like, well, you know, I'll just buy them because I don't I want some kid getting that. <laughs> just the one, though? Yeah. <laughs> Did he so buy like, them 10 at a time? He, he would claim that he would buy multiple copies, <laughs> but I'd picture someone doing that with Soul Man. <laughs> they're just really into Soul Man. And they're like, I'm just buying them so they don't get in the wrong hands. Look, it's for the best. Yeah. You just, I'm going to uh, rent this 29 times. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do so that someone else can't rent it. But that's not how it works. It's Netflix. It doesn't, you can still get it if someone else has it. It's checked out. It's checked out. <laughs> It's, checked, it's <laughs> yeah. checked out off of Netflix. Yeah, I checked it out. So were you mostly watching movie stuff as a kid? Or were you like, was there any show you ever watched because of those teen magazines that you're like, this person's on it, got to watch this show? God, um, let me think. I think, I'm trying to think of who went from like movies to TV. We had um, uh, Chris Makepeace. <laughs> Chris, Make- <laughs> Chris Makepeace, I did love him as a, he was such a late 70s, early 80s child actor. Yeah. Because they all looked like little men. Yep. They all had a kind of a Jewish, cultural Jewish personality yep. traits. Yep. Like, uh, I- I'm nervous and uh, yeah. I'm a little neurotic. Oh, uh, even there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that kid who played Ratner in The Fast Times. Yes, exactly. That kind of thing, yeah. Yes, exactly. Where you which which is actually very appealing to a young girl because there's a certain there's that kind of sweet sincerity about it where as opposed to being like just too the, cocky like Yeah, the guy that's just trying to crush the crush the ladies. Instead it's like, No, but I work at the peace place and I see yeah. you over at the movie theater or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> where it's calming for a girl. I, I never forget when I learned that 
um, that whole thing of like the Beatlemania, um, teenage girls screaming about bands and getting crazy about movie stars when yeah. they're young adolescents, that is all a reaction to the coming dating life and sex life that they know they're going to have. So that's just them burning off that anxiety and hysteria from the fact that they know that's coming. Isn't that the craziest thing? That's insane. But, it, you know, I wonder if it's too because it's no, there's no, it's a one way. Yes. So they kind of, they kind of know that like it's it's not gonna it's safe. Yes. Almost like it's a safe way to be crazed. Safe. You and it's also um it, you know it's it's mass hysteria. So it's yeah. like the girl next to you screaming, then you start screaming, and it feels so good because there's this pressure of knowing when you're 13 or 14 that eventually that's going to get turned toward you, right. and either it's going to go really badly or you're going to find the love of your life, or right. you know Chachi will dedicate and write yeah. and t- t- tie a bandana around his leg for you forever. <laughs> he'll leave his um <laughs> he'll leave his wife who thinks that the Sandy Hook shooting was crisis actors oh, for you God. <laughs> i mean I, if only yeah I, I feel like a lot of those people there's some people it's not a malicious belief they just can't deal with reality yeah or they're just really dumb yeah and someone showed them a video and they're like yep yep this is the way we're gonna do it yep. we're gonna think this way and this is way easier yeah because <clears throat> we can't take it on but i can only imagine scott Bayo was so horribly abused as a kid actor like i just imagine that awful things that happened to that kid i mean none of the oh, it might have been different on the happy day set because yeah you know, but like, he was also in like foxes and was kind of doing the rounds yes. in the movies and, and he's part of that travolta family thing yeah. where they all were in it to win it and yeah. even the mother was in it yeah so then yeah then nobody has there's nobody's minding the shop do you remember when travolta's uh no it wasn't travolta's mother it was stallone's mother jackie yes when she she had a foxy boxing league <laughs> <laughs> that was a pay-per-view thing and it was a boxing like she had this whole series was trying to be like wdf and it was like jackie stallone's foxy boxing no. and it was oh, did they yeah. all have super long nails like her they had the, the gloves on so i don't know but oh, they okay. might have. and she was in glow <laughs> the first season was she really she was a manager of the actual glow not the netflix show she was a manager of like oh. some of the wrestlers oh shit yeah so that was a little bit real yeah she was dipping in like cindy law style yes. of like i remember that whole like lou albano being in that uh in the girls just want to have yep. fun video and me being like who is this disgusting man yeah. with rubber bands in his what beard is he doing why do i have to look at yeah. this i don't want to look at this i do love the goonies are good enough video though <laughs> <laughs> any i was always a sucker for music videos from a movie where they get the people from the movie yes. to be in the thing. Yes. But it always weirded me out that they would usually shot on video and you're used to seeing them in the movie. And as a kid, I didn't, I didn't know why that was weird. Yes. But I'm like, why are they look different? But it's them. And I don't. I don't like this. It's too real. It's too, it's like people walked off a movie screen and then yeah. into a, a weird, creepy video. Yeah. I was like, I uh, yeah. I I did a. Uh, Again, sorry for the tangent, but no. I, did a, I did a screening of Goonies with Sean Astin, and we did Q and A after. And this little chubby kid was in the front row, and every time we had a question, he was like desperate, <laughs> oh, 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 like they had this really good ask this question. And uh, Sean was picking the people, so he didn't pick this kid. And then we, I was like, "Are right, we go one more question?" And I'm like, "We have this kid asked. He's, <laughs> he's like desperate to ask this question." So we pick him, and the kid's psyched, and he goes, "Okay, the Fratellis, right?" They have a restaurant and we're like yeah and he goes all they serve is tongue and ice cream what kind of restaurant is that <laughs> <laughs> that was the question that he was like desperate to ask the whole time and i'm like i'm so glad that we waited so long for this kid to be able to ask this question and we were like i don't know and he's like okay Yes, there's some of those <laughs> there's some of those things that can't be answered. You're just gonna have yeah. to sit with that for the rest it's of your like life. Like, what is the one hand clapping question? <laughs> it's a Confucius question yes. for your generation. Sit with that Zen cone for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I so I imagine that Bayo had that weird. Remember his brother acted for a while. Yeah, Jimmy Bayo. Yes, he's in. Um, they pushed him hard in those Tiger Beat Teen Beat things, uh, and he was a little more. You know what he was? He was like a little man in that yeah. way. He was very much like a little Las Vegas lounge singer yes 
It was very strange. He he was supposed to be the lead in uh, Facts of Life, which had the most backdoor pilots out of any show in the world. Yeah. They tried to do one with uh, <laughs> the, the military school. Yeah. And he was the lead. He was like the lead guy that was going to be in the military school. But I feel like he, even for 80s child sitcom acting, he took it one step too far. Yeah. Like you were like, eh, you need to dial it back a tiny bit because you're a bit too much 35-year-old <laughs> Philadelphia lawyer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As a 12-year-old. It's yeah. disturbing. You need a little bit of that like Ricky Schroeder believability. That's true. And I don't think anyone's ever said the phrase Ricky Schroeder believability. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> it, we can go back right back into Tiger Beat and talk about Ricky Schroeder. Ricky Schroeder was there. I guess that was like 10 and 11, but when he was on Silver Spoons. Yeah. Um, just because he had that beautiful face. Oh, yeah. He's angelic. Yes. Yeah. And he was playing like the Ricker. You know, he's playing yes. like a cool guy, too. He was never um, like nervous on that show or like. No. It was, although Silver Spoons is one of my favorite, very special episodes where this is another thing that I never had happen in high school. Did, in your high school, did they have a thing where you had to pretend to be married to someone else to do like <laughs> home ec? <clears throat> yeah, we had it. It was it, you had a bag of lentils as a baby. Okay. And you had a partner that you had to take care of the baby with. Did you have to do like budgets and all that kind of stuff? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So apparently that does happen. Yeah. But in this one, uh, Rick's uh, partner is played by Suzanne Snyder, who's in Weird Science and yeah. uh, she's blonde. Mm -hmm. And she's actually pregnant. She got like teenage girl knocked up by her boyfriend who dumped her. Oh, right. And um, so Rick has to like console her and then she, they get in a big fight. And then like Aaron Gray's like, oh, it's like the heaviest, <laughs> weirdest episode. <laughs> and there's a scene where they're at Burgers, that place they used to hang out. Yep. And she's decided she's not pregnant. She's going to dance. She starts break dancing what and rick's like what are you doing you can't do that don't do that she's like why and, and he's like because you're pregnant and then it's like needle <laughs> off the record everybody hears it and she like won't talk to him anymore and i'm like silver spoons don't go don't try to do very specials no it's not for you also because they were too young <laughs> they were too young on that show to be yeah, pregnant I that's it, gross it was later i think they were like 15 but still <clears throat> oh yeah it was it was highly inappropriate best spinoff of silver spoons is Jason Bateman in uh, it's, your, it's move. your move the best fucking show yeah when that thing came on because it was like syndicated Saturday show yep. and him, wasn't the guy's name Norman Lamb yeah um that idea that it was like because everyone we knew his parents were getting divorced yeah and that idea that it was a little kid fucking with his mom's boyfriend is so genius whoever thought of that and then watching jason bateman as a 12 year old sitting yeah. there going i can't believe this boy exists he is so smart he is so funny he he had all those things of like being a little young man but seemed young but truly was still a 12 year old boy yeah and then so cute like everything about it, I was just like that. That was another whole different direction. Yeah, charming, smarmy. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, like yeah. But he acted like a little Phil Silvers. Like, yes. What was this like cute kid? Uh, and and that show. I mean, the Dregs of Humanity one. Is yes. one that <laughs> yeah. it's, where it's a two parter where he convinces his high school this band exists. Try to get paid, yep. then says they all died in a car crash, but then has to actually play and use his skeleton. It's like freaking a Bernie. Dregs of humanity. Oh, it's such a bizarre thing. He, I, oh, I think I blend that one with the WKRP episode um, where the punk band comes in. Yes, yes. I thought they were named Dregs of Humanity. What's that band's name? They're like another one that's like, it might be funny if they are, it might have been the same writer or something. He's like, I always throw the dregs of humanity and stuff. <laughs> well, the whole like depiction of punk rock on 80s TV as a whole, one of my favorite, just the Chips episode. The, yes. The uh, Quincy, where I'm like, no, punk rockers don't have beards. <laughs> They don't have beards. They wouldn't have that. Yeah. Just, sorry, this is another tangent, but do you remember the Chips episode? My sister and I talk about this all the time, where they were funny cars were driving down the freeway. Yes. So like one person merges, <laughs> get, you know, gets over a lane and it looks like a car is driving toward them. Yeah. Like the funny cars what, wreaked havoc. Ooh, yeah. It was so insane. Yeah. It was like a there were because the guys were running like it was like a drug ring or something out of the the race. What do you call those race tracks? Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, the yeah. Track or something. Like a, yeah, uh, yes. I always loved on that show how Ponch was always going undercover. 
<laughs> like, you no. Know, like, they don't have... This is CHP. That's not how it works. It's in no way this part, that part of the police You station. write traffic tickets. I love that. You know, Chris Pine's dad was the captain on that show. Oh, was he? I didn't even know that. Yeah, you know the guy with a little bit of a, like, a sparse comb oh, over? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Chris Pine's dad. That's amazing. I love... Because I remember the first thing I saw Chris Pine in, I was like, he's ridiculously beautiful and like Jason Bateman together. Yeah. Like c- the confidence that doesn't make you mad, even though he's that beautiful. Yeah. Like ha- where is this guy from? And then it, that's his dad where I'm like, that's so LA. This makes sense. It's so perfect. It just, I felt very proud. Well, the thing I always uh, am fascinated by here is that everyone is very beautiful. Like everyone, because the prettiest girl in Oklahoma moved here and yep. didn't make it, but now her son works at the gas station. Yes, <laughs> like, exactly. Whatever it is. So it's just like, I'm a handsome hot dog seller. Yeah. Like, it's just because it's just years of like selective breeding that has come out. It's so true. And there's nothing, there's nothing better than like re- recently I've been on the road a lot um, performing and being in other cities and getting snapped out of that LA because you, you live here long enough and you're like, I should get it lip implants. That yeah. is something I, I should it do. looks normal it looks it would be i would be so much prettier we're like <laughs> what no first yeah. of all you you know like if you're over 30 it's over for you anyway don't get plastic surgery you're yeah. done no one is gonna go you know now that you've had that done yeah no you can play the 25 year old <laughs> in this movie <laughs> no and also i i remember when i very first moved here i saw we went to my friend worked for i think she worked for comedy central so we got to go to the mtv movie awards the oh, year wow. that um will smith hosted oh yeah, yeah okay just before he broke huge and he was he was still he just he, did six degrees of separation yes yep. he was just becoming a movie star it's like 94 or something yes yep. and we went to the MTV Movie Awards, and then afterwards, when we were in like an after party, I saw Alyssa Milano in real life, and she is spectacularly gorgeous. But she's also pocket size. Yeah. she is like four foot ten. Yeah, and I remember standing there in all my San Francisco weight and height. <laughs> going oh my god i have to get out of this town like the you this is the starting point you have to be child-sized and have a perfect fucking face yeah just to just to even start it's like a different species of people though you're like that's you can't just like people don't get like their shins shortened no <laughs> like, <laughs> i can't have my yeah. shoulders narrowed yeah, it's cannot, never gonna happen i am not plasticine <laughs> no it does not work like gumby no yeah it's almost comforting because it's just like that is the you know i try to say that to people all where you don't have to be in the beauty contest because the beauty contest will make you insane yeah you can be in the potato chorus and and feel great about and it it's great you get paid yeah you get to go to the show yeah <laughs> yeah <it's, laughs> you get to be a part of yeah. things although it's strange like, yes. you cannot attain that it's just there and it's the like those people you rarely see a person like somebody like Shirley. i've never seen her in real life but i mean you see her in every movie and she's those people where you're like you're six feet tall you're very thin and you also have perfect skin like yeah. those things always come together because that's the breeding thing of like <laughs> yeah. your rich dad married a model yeah. and so it's all coming together whereas it's just like yeah you can't you rarely see people with just one of those things. yes yeah it, it's always like the trifecta yeah of course just to make you feel as bad as possible right where you're like so i have a big ass and huge pores yeah. this is fucking bullshit i remember once i was and i i have had what I would call no success in the uh, industry, <laughs> but I had a, what I would yes, call, <laughs> but I had a, it was a producer guy. It was, it might've been even someone from Montreal. And, uh, they said to me, look, you're, you're all right looking guy, but what's going to happen is to find someone funnier than you to write something for someone better looking than you. Jesus <laughs> and I was Christ. like, well, I'm going to go kill myself now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's like okay, so perfect. I yeah. mean that it that's possible, yeah, I'm and then sure also that's true. <laughs> any other number of things yeah. could happen. I mean that's kind of the cool thing now is if you had told me when I was 25 that eventually there would be a trend where huge asses became popular, I'd be like, <laughs> there's simply no way that would solve all my yes. problems. But like as as a middle aged woman, I'm watching this thing happen where there's this allowance of like <laughs> width and girth in a way that someone's like, let me introduce my friends sir mix a lot yes exactly. <laughs> these people know what they're talking about yeah these rappers but uh these rappers girlfriends these rappers girlfriends no <laughs> well it's weird like when i lived in the uk um and 
wa- watch shows over there, which blew my mind. When, this is in the late 90s, early 2000s, because people who wrote the show were usually in the show. Yes. And so they looked like people who wrote the show. Yeah. <laughs> and it's perfect and great. And it was so jarring because we we get that now, but not even that much. Well, and we certainly, it, they've been doing it with women all along. Yeah. And that's that thing where when you watch a show like Happy Valley, you know, it's about a female cop and the woman who plays the part is a middle-aged woman who looks like she could be an actual cop that takes care of business, not like a model that's got cop clothes She's on. the sheriff? Yes. Is that Suzanne <laughs> Summers? <laughs> Although she really was the sheriff. I mean, she could totally thigh master people to death, like very easily. <laughs> no, I've always loved that. Uh, you, but you know why? Like I did a show in um, in for Channel Four. Oh yeah, and it's the people the people who make the show. They when they get their pilot, uh, um, you know, what do you call it? I want to say approved. I've lost <laughs> my mind. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. When they're greenlit. Then they go make the show that they pitched. Yeah. The the network doesn't come and fuck around and go what like. What do you think about dolphins? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've got a niece that you should hire and yeah. put into this role, even though it makes no sense. They leave people alone, so then they can create these realistic worlds, and they don't come in and going, "Yeah, we need to." Like it's just that. That's the problem with Hollywood is they all it get right. Hollywoodized. Right. They're like, hey, fidget spinners testing huge yeah can you change the boyfriend character into a fidget spinner <laughs> everyone's gonna love yeah. it don't you, worry do you remember the show the famous teddy z did you ever watch it with john crier no um it, hugh wilson created it who did um wkrp yeah and um it's it's a really funny show but he managed to sort of trojan horse the show because the premise was john crier works in the mailroom at like a caa type place was it sorry single camera or three camera three camera okay and um there's a marlon brando type actor who's a real asshole and and um he has to drive him one day and gets in a fight with the guy and ends up kicking his ass and the guy's like i want you to be my new manager so he gets thrown into the world of like he's now a big agent and so it's him and all these old men and one of them's played by alex rocco from the godfather yes movie. and the show ends up just becoming a show about alex rocco and about these old men in caa type place but there's an episode where this these people come in and they pitch a documentary series about like these sandinista type people and they greenlit it and as the show goes on and this is so well written in the context of the show this makes perfect sense (laughs) by the end of the show it's now a show about a woman in a tube top with a talking porpoise (laughs) (laughs) and it's through everyone goes hey how about we do this and like oh yeah sure we and it's per like it just it made like you understand how that happens watching this episode uh and and it when you think about it, you're like, oh, my God. Yes. But these poor people, they just want their show to get made. So they agree to everything. Of course. And it's little teeny incremental things and a different person. Comes in, and it's so funny. That's hilarious. It's great. Did you ever see, I think it was called Mistresses, that movie with Robert De Niro? Yes. It's the same thing. And it's so, ex- I mean, I feel like people, if you're not interested in ho- true Hollywood, then it would be a really boring movie. But if you have any interest in show business, it's exactly what happens where you're people that are directors or, or screenwriters or whatever, you think like, oh, you've got something bought or they're going to make something and we got it made. Yeah. And that's just when your problems start. And it is the, all that crazy stuff of like, everyone's insane and everyone's making these demands right. and put my girlfriend in this. She needs to be the lead. And I mean, it's incredible. Because they have the mo- it's it's funny too. Like I had, I had Emmanuel Lewis on, and that was one of the most fascinating episodes. Because I, I bet he, really nice guy. I felt horrible for him. He didn't feel bad, but like talking to him, I was like, oh, this poor kid, had, right? You know, childhood. What a weird childhood. Yeah, and yeah. he was. I didn't. We learned this later. He was a huge star in Japan first. He had oh. a, he had a single there, and it was like a rap song he did as like a, a child. Yeah, like three or four years old. Gigantic song in Japan. Then he was the Burger King kid. Yeah. And so this huge thing. But uh, we, we were talking about Webster. And I had read that the show was originally Alex Karras and um, <clears throat> I can't remember her name now. Uh, Susan? Played, something? Yes, Susan something. They were a real couple. Yes. And so they got a development deal to do a show about them being a real couple. They had Emmanuel <laughs> Lewis sign to do a thing. And they just threw the shows together because they couldn't put two shows in the schedule. Right. So their show was called Then Came You, which is they had everything done, the theme song, everything, threw him on the show. And I asked him about that, and he was like, no, it was my show from the beginning. They had nothing. And I was like, oh, that's totally true story. Because <laughs> there's no way that 
because it was like I'm sure as a kid they told them like this is your show 100% or, yeah they uh, the fucking lie and just everything's about placating the talent yeah but also with how hilarious that they would get a show that far along down which is about Alex Karras and yeah. his wife like who gives a single shit I mean like two middle aged people yeah. where it's like I mean it's a nice idea it's basically mad about you without the anxiety yeah football mad about you yeah, yeah. it's like what what <laughs> I don't people that was that weird time when everybody loved Alex Karras like post porkies yes <laughs> that's like, right that's the best he looks like a cartoon yep. he looks like a cartoon like a Beetle Bailey cartoon essentially yes, yes. Um, and I have to say that wife was fascinating yes and great like I really loved watching her as a kid of like who's this woman with the red hair short She's, really short like annie lennox hair yes and she was like a lawyer or something and she had caftans yeah. and stuff and she was very pure one imports yes she like, was. Yeah, this real like i go to macy's <laughs> <laughs> these <laughs> chocolates are from yes. amsterdam <laughs> you know the perfume counter sometimes i buy the samples <laughs> that they spray on me <laughs> yes. yeah she's like the art teacher got a sitcom yes absolutely and i've rewatched that show and that is not great no uh, i bet but that was the, not the king of very specials, but there are some brutal ones in there. Oh, my God. There's a home invasion episode. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Webster, they let him stay home alone because he's like, come on, I don't need a babysitter. I'm old enough. And he's bragging about it at school. And so these old, this kid's older brother overhear him and they come in with ski masks on and like beat him up and, and uh, invade the house and rob him. And then like uh, it ends up working out okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> because it's yeah, Webster. He burns down the apartment. Um, with a chemi- chemistry set, and that's where they move into this house. He's like, "What? Yeah, oh yeah, it's it's like what is? There's an episode where he walks in on Mam and George having sex. No, yeah, and they have the whole episode is them explaining what it was, and George goes, "No, Webb, we were uh, changing a light bulb." <laughs> and it's like that's the running. J- it's uh, it's that weird tone where like these old men who started writing for TV probably in the '60s, maybe '70s, yeah, kind of were didn't. The world was changing and they didn't really quite get stuff. Right. And they were aiming shows not just at kids, but kind of at kids. And these guys didn't quite get the tone. Right. This was back when nothing was aimed at kids. Yeah. Like, this was back when... And I, and it's so funny to think of now, but it's like, anytime you watch nighttime TV, it all was... It was like... Everything was kind of aimed for like a 50-year-old man eating yeah. soup in front of the TV. Yes. They had not figured out that kids were this huge market that they yeah. could exploit. Tweens have money. Yes, exactly. So everything was just like, it was like, it took Janet Jackson being on different strokes for them to be like, oh, this shouldn't, we don't care what happens to Mr. Drummond. Yeah. It should be about these boys yeah. and their lives. Like that kind of slow awakening was like, as you sat there in front of the TV, you were like, oh yeah, I actually don't care about Mr. Drummond. Yeah, he got He's, remarried. Great. I don't care. I don't care about his relationship. <laughs> yeah. Dixie Carter's cool. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's nice yeah. and all to have a lady with a Southern accent. Sam's chained to a radiator, everybody. <laughs> Do you remember and th- this will be particular to your interests also the Night Stalker episode of Punky Brewster no the, about the real serial killer Richard Ramirez no fucking yes. way so Punky wait weren't they in New York Chicago okay um, although the the apartment building they shot at is down in Koreatown and I've gone and visited it it's, oh, uh, it looks exactly the same <laughs> it's by MacArthur Park um, but uh she hears about the Night Stalker on TV, is terrified. She's like asking Henry, like, is he going to come in my window and murder me? And it's like this whole thing about like, oh, no, you're fine. Like, don't be scared. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't think I had, I was probably five or six. I'm like, I don't know what the Night Stalker is. And then, of course, I see it. So I'm like, what's this Night Stalker you talk about? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which now is, it's time to investigate. Yeah. Uh, horrifying. And like, I get what they were trying to do, but that is not a good idea. No, because... I think if you had if you had to balance, I think if parents had their say, it'd be like, no, we've we've made sure they don't hear about the Night Stalker, so we don't need to process this as a nation. Yeah, that's you're also crazy. Like, I should tell my kid about the Night Stalker because you know he might run into him. <laughs> like it's not going to happen. Like it's not beneficial no. for a kid to know about the Night Stalker. <clears throat> that's such a uh, that to me, I think that reflects people freaking out in L.A. because yeah. it's such an L.A. crime, and then for a little while, San Francisco crime, but. Um, that's basically like people being like, this is our problem, but now we're making it everybody's yeah. problem. But there was a lot of that too, like the Zodiac 
or like there, or even the, like Elvira got she's not she didn't commit a crime when she murdered all those people, <laughs> but um, who's Be great amazing. but was a very LA thing. Yes, and as a result, got on all these shows, and the same with like Rick Dees. Yes, and just that were like very very LA. And well, if, yeah. Rick Dees had those like uh, Disco Duck. He had Disco all those Duck. terrible hits. Oh, his, those. <laughs> one of my other odd hobbies is that I collect old uh, broadcasts of American Top Forty and Weekly Top Forty. Oh wow! So I have them all digitized because the was uh, that Casey. Kasem? Casey Kasem was America Top 40, and then he was um, replaced by Shadow Stevens. Yes, okay. Because Casey Kasem wanted more money, and then he went and did Casey's Top 40. Okay. And uh, <laughs> two things I, so one of my, I've, I've always wanted to do this is either a live show or a show is do a rescue 911 style thing, but for long distance dedication, because <laughs> those stories are insane. Yes, they truly and are. My favorite one is this guy who goes, uh, uh, I was in a car accident and I lost the use of my legs. And one day in our barn, we found a teenage runaway girl who wouldn't tell us her name, so we just called her Mystery. And one day, <laughs> he goes, Do-, and then he, this is an actual thing he says. He goes, "Doctors told me I could walk again if I just wished hard enough." What? Right? He goes, "So <laughs> that's not true. That's not, totally not true. <laughs> this isn't the thing." And he goes, "So Misty, one day we were by the pool and she ju- she fell in and was drowning, and I jumped on." my wheelchair and saved her and she said i knew you could do it i was just pretending to drown and i told her i hated her and how dare she do that and i never saw her again and like this song goes out to the mystery <laughs> totally yeah. clear yeah. for the heart that's my favorite thing because it's always like here's billy ocean with the, <laughs> but, um, caribbean it was, queen it was one about these people that blew up on a tractor and they were also little people <laughs> like yeah. it's the weirdest what? thing and a phrase that i can't believe pops up all the time is despite being deaf <laughs> it's always like, and she never, never faltered despite being deaf. <laughs> and then it's a song dedicated to her, like she's deaf. So they were totally written then. They had to be, yeah. Just, but so I would love to have like reenactments of them because yes, they're, they're amazing. But um, and I, also everyone grew up listening. To yeah, that, so yeah. everyone would kind of go like, oh, I remember that. One. I found one person who actually wrote one because it was from Lowell Mass. So I looked her <laughs> up and I emailed her, and she was like, yeah, it was about she met some French kid up in Maine one summer and they had a little romance and then he stopped writing her <laughs> it's like and John John Baptiste was like it's like the ridiculous <laughs> thing but um the the Rick, the Rick D's ones are so god awful because he <laughs> He tries to be funny, yes. and it's so offensive. And, like everything's <laughs> just a gay joke, but it's just like he. It's always about Richard Simmons, Ugh. and he and he's. Oh, it's the worst, but it's like, it, it's fun to listen to. Awful. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Because it's so insincere. Well, it's another one of those things where it's, this is how it used to be. It, the, saying these things publicly was totally fine. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that you know these days, those people that are like, people are trying to police my language. It's like. Yeah. You just want things to be as hideous and insensitive as they used to be. I had a, a, a Boston, old Boston comic almost punch me one night uh, <laughs> because he was complaining about that, which happens to me a lot because I'm a white guy. So like, hey, there's none of them around. Let's see. Yeah. You know, which sure. makes me extra mad. And he was complaining about political correctness. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. And I let him talk. And then he stopped. And I go, oh, you're mad because you don't know who it's okay to be racist in front of anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And then he got so mad. And it was one of my favorite things I've gotten to say to someone. One of my favorite stand-up sets was watching Tom Kenny. Because, you know, Tom Kenny and Bobcat started. started. Yeah. They, like, grew up together in upstate New York, but then they started in Boston. Yeah. Tom Kenny did a set one night talking about those guys and how every comic in Boston in the 80s would end a joke by either flushing something down the toilet or... <laughs> kicking it yep. like going get out of here fuck out of here yeah. Yeah. and he him doing the impression of these incredibly racist jokes these incredibly sexist offensive things and then just being like flush it down the toilet <laughs> it was one of the funniest things i've ever they seen they still do that yeah. um, i've seen comics in 2018 use the word towel head on stage Whoa. ironically repeatedly <sighs> uh uh darky that one's been said on stage right because i think they're like what it's not the n-word that's the one we can't say right wow uh but it's uh, i I used to do this character when i first started in boston i used to do a character named nick galen that the premise was i was a boston comic in the 80s i moved out here and was a warm-up comic for years and moved back and now i'm like the superintendent of a building (laughs) and it was all like jokes my dad would tell but i used to have this this bit in there that was about the move and the look when you're driving and you do the look you, you missed it. 
and then you do the move. Like it was just <laughs> that over and over again. This guy that you do it, you did it like that. Thing. And there's a guy who who like liked that bit, and I don't think he knew that I was doing a character. And he's always like, "You would do that look in the move bit still? That was great." And I'm uh. like, "No, that's not." That wasn't not, me. Yeah. That wasn't Cause my I, voice. Because I also go like, I was down in Florida, and I see this place, Patio Furniture. It's got to be a good pub, right? <laughs> it's a bar. It's not even a bar. Like, it's just that kind of stuff. And people are like, I love that yeah, bit. It was so good. Are you going to use that? So different. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's an odd place, the Boston area. It's but tough. But there is, there is that thing, and it it they never really rightfully so uh presented it on sitcoms either and all those guys had a sitcom at some point or another yeah um lenny clark had like 40 of them yeah yeah um and they just, they never work yeah all the time i don't know how uh they never work and the only one that works has no boston comics and it's cheers cheers that's right because i think it took outsider people to like get how you present those kind of people like with some heart <laughs> Yeah, because I think I, I think that it, in general, like it's like you want a Cliff Clave and you want the accent and you want a strong personality. Yeah. But being like racist isn't a personality. No. That's just almost like it's your it's the sad fact of your upbringing. But they'll also be like, you know, I'm not like that. Yes. Like, no, exactly. but you, but you, well, you just are. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. It's very weird. Yeah, so they're like, we'll take the racist out of Cliff Clavin, but the know-it-all and everything else is perfect. Yeah, save the other yeah. stuff that everyone can relate to, and let's not bum everybody out. You know what's interesting, though? I, uh, a friend of mine who's like a millennial, uh, who is a millennial, was had never seen Cheers, and had heard it was great. So she's like, I'm going to watch it on Netflix. And she was horrified by it because of the way women were treated and like the jokes. And I was... I was really like, I don't get, I don't understand. But then I, I rewatched it. I'm like, all right, I kind of get what she's saying. But what I was picking up on that she wasn't, it was mostly the Sam and Diana. Diane, Diana. Yeah. She wasn't picking up on the class difference. Yeah. Or that she's an intellectual college student and he's a blue collar. Like, that's where that dynamic is coming from. And she was just reading it as male, female. Right. And if, well, and there's so many like he he picks up on so many women that just sit there and are pretty and have nothing to say. Yeah. Which is but that's just the construct of you you're you're not going to want to give the hot girl a ton of jokes because she's just serving she's just there to be the cardboard cutout yeah. of something to piss Diane off. Yeah. And and you have the 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 counterpoint of of Carla who is one of the realest fucking characters yeah. of all time. Yeah. I think people get very lost in that. I think I think that happens a lot of time that reactivity where you go you want to dismiss something out of hand because you're seeing one thing that's problematic and you're not it it, it blinds you to the things that like there was nothing that made me happier as a young girl that loved comedy than Carla Tortelli on that yeah. show. She was a fucking badass. They were all afraid of her, but they all loved her. Yeah. And she said whatever the fuck she wanted, and she did whatever she wanted. But and she'd also was, bust your balls and then stand up for you because you're like, work, you're a friend. Yes. You know, which is a, but she had, they gave her her jokes as good as, and also Diane's jokes were amazing. Yeah. I mean, like that show's so perfectly written. Yeah. And I understand it's like still from the 80s, so there's going to be problems, but yeah. all together. And, and then later on when Christy Alley came on. Just is good just as good and the real Kirstie Alley being in love with her boss was the realest thing as like a teenage girl watching that and you're making all these terrible decisions because you've decided that this man is the one yeah like that everything about that storyline was so real and so hilarious and she also like Sam would try to like cut her down and she always had a comeback yeah. like there was no she wasn't the weakling but was a lunatic a like, totally she wasn't weak with it she was neurotic and nuts but also still his boss and still it was the the power dynamics on that show I don't think I've ever seen a show that got them as well yeah and the the which is I hated Frasier. People love it, and I, the reason I don't like it is because it's not Frasier. It's a different character. Yes. Because the thing that was great about him was he's this stuck-up intellectual. He's an alcoholic. Yeah. So he's <laughs> there with everyone who's also. It's like the great. You know, they're all Equalizer, the same yes. now. And Sam is above everybody because he's not an alcoholic anymore, and he lords over them, and he plays it that way. Yes. And it. it it's, but he does have this weakness of women, yes. which I think is as much as at like um, 
uh, Rebecca had the weakness of um, her boss. Right. What, why can't I remember his name? Remember his name Mr. Either. Drake. Yes. Um, well, she loved a couple because she loved Robin and she loved Mr. Yes. Drake. Yeah. But and Robin was a real dick. Oh my God, he Ugh. was. She should never. No. But he, Sam, when Sam would go into things, I remember there was the one where he kept driving up to the ski lodge. Yes. Like he had just his weaknesses were as strong. Yeah. So it wasn't that thing of presenting it like he's got it all together and, you know, he's he's killing it in bed every night. Right. It was like his experiences were empty and he really did want this woman who was his equal. Yeah. There was so and he'd much... And never have her. Right. It was, it's never going to work. Yeah, it's... I don't know why we haven't been able to get like a like a sick... Like, I, I love three-camera sitcoms and I feel like they're unfairly maligned. Yeah. And I think it's because they're really hard to do. Yes, to, they are. To be able... It's like doing a play every week. Like, it is. And you can't rely on cutaway jokes and you can't rely on that kind of stuff and it, people and maybe they don't want to tackle it maybe because it's difficult yeah um but like barney miller cheers perfect wkrp, WKRP yeah like yes. just being able to do that people talking <laughs> because i think they have to cast it like a play i think it has to be like i think the the office even though i know it's not three camera brought that thing back of this is what people really look like in an office right. and so you can already believe what's happening because we've got the documentary filmmaking element going and then we yeah. just have like real office people who are like taking looks into cameras like what the fuck is happening yeah. and you're right there with it whereas there's this period of time in the 90s and i think we we were done a great disservice by like the ally mcbeal period where every woman had to be dying of anorexia yes. and then it was like if poor she Lara slipped on a what, what? <laughs> poor laura flynn boy i mean but like they the comedy for women became you're anorexic and you fall down yes or, or you scream or you're one of the dudes and you want to smoke a cigar and you're horny yeah and it's that's cool and funny because you're like oh, i'll play in pool yeah <laughs> like it was like wait why, why yeah yes exactly but there was still not there was no people whereas yeah. like if you were in, you believed every single person in cheers was a real person yeah and wings too like that was like the, the three shows i always say are under the 90s shows that i think hold up the best are news radio yeah oh yeah wings and mad about you yes because they're people characters and it's mostly talking it's yes. not as much as seinfeld i loved when it was on when i rewatch it now once you know the sort of gimmick of the episode I, i'm like i don't feel like i want to watch it again because yes. it's just not as funny whereas this where it's the banter and the characters yeah and people got to talk as themselves yeah whereas like in a lot of those sitcoms everyone was just talking like themselves unlike the four writers that you yes. know got the most jokes in yeah friends everyone talks the same it's all <laughs> yeah. it, and it's also the way of talking where if, if you started talking to me like that in real life, I'd be like, well, gotta go. Because yeah. I don't want to listen to you like just talk at me and riff at me. But people, so why do you do comedy shows? <laughs> <laughs> That's the great. You know the one show, because I said the word and then it put this in my mind. Did you ever watch The Equalizer? Yes. So Edward Woodward. Ugh, do you, I love, for some reason, I loved that show, even yeah. though it, at the time it was way out of my wheelhouse. But I think it was my deep down true crime, the beginnings of it. Yeah. Did you ever see the episode on the Equalizer about the little girl that was being abused by her father? Yes. It is the darkest thing of all time. Yes. There was a lot of shows that were tackling that. Those our crime dramas from the 80s, like Hunter, which is the most violent show. <laughs> he murders thousands of people. Yeah, and he's a insane. thug. He's an angry... He's not charming. No. Nope. He's an ex-football player, and he comes across like one. And he's not wearing underwear. Not wearing underwear. <laughs> uh, there's an episode of that called Killer in a Halloween Mask that uh, is just... It's just like him beating the shit out of people. <laughs> and then you're just like, everyone's bad on this show. Yes. Uh, but even like Spencer for Hire is the one that I love. And I've rewatched that frequently, partly because I like seeing the Boston I grew up in. But yeah. it's gritty and dark. And like there's an episode where um, Kevin Conroy, who's the voice of Batman and everything, yeah. uh, plays a child molester pyromaniac oh, who fuck. turns out he's the guy who killed all these kids. And it's like there's no redemption it's just like grim and like uh and the equalizer was like that it yeah. was like i love the concept of that show because he was like i did awful things yes and now i'm trying to make it right so sometimes i have to like murder like straight up murder people i'm just gonna go outside the bounds of law yeah. and just take care of business for people who can't take care of it themselves yeah. it's such a good idea but that i remember being way too fucking young and watching that episode alone oh bad idea very bad idea and 
and that was that kind of that happened all the time because it was like p- adults would assume you're sitting in front of the TV all yeah. night. Of course, it's, it's going to be CBS. Fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and it was like I never knew children. I didn't understand that children were treated that way. I assumed everyone lived the exact same life I right. lived, and everything was pretty chill. You got your Cheerios in the morning. <laughs> right. You got yelled at if you fucked up, and that was pretty much it. Yeah. And it was like watching a little girl because she was probably seven, seven or, eight. or eight. Yeah. I mean, and this crazy father. It was so awful. Oh, yeah. It was it, it was the kind of thing where, like, you would get... I don't know if it was specifically that episode that did this to me, but, like, nothing was worse as a kid than being over your friend's house and they were getting yelled at. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they just do it in front of you. And, like, yep. um, and after seeing that and, like, a couple other things, you were like, oh, my God, their father's a murderer. <laughs> like, yes. you just have this suspicion yes. all of a sudden. Yeah. And it was... It was an interesting thing because that stuff lived in the made for TV movie for in the seventies and early eighties. That's where that lived. Yes. You know, and those are horrifically grim. I mean, we saw every child molesty um, incest. Do you remember there's something about Amelia yep. with fucking Ted Danson? Yeah. That was shot in Northern California. Oh, okay. And there's a boy that went to the, the high school, the private boys high school, one town up from ours that later on, or maybe at the same time we met him, he was in that as the boy that goes to the dance with Amelia. Okay. And is basically like the one going, there's something about Amelia. But that whole thing, I remember watching it or watching the one um, with Richard Mazur where he is the child molester. Yes. And he's so likable. Yes. He's such a like likable character that you are. And, and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. They're teaching you the lesson of it could be this nice guy that yeah. wants you to help him find a puppy. Yeah. Every t- everything I saw of Richard Mazur and after that I was just like he molests children even license to drive <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter yes yeah it was I mean yeah. Yeah, we should not like have Gordon Jump it. even on the different strokes yes. episode. Um, but that one is that one specifically you have writers who were also trying to make it funny yes so the do you remember what he makes Dudley play uh, I remember them drinking wine. Drinking wine. T- saying it was grape juice. He goes, he made us play a game called Neptune King of the Sea. What? Which is such a comedy <laughs> writer being like, oh my God, you know, and people will be like, what the hell is that? And, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be specific, but yeah. you're uncomfortable yes. about the idea of yeah, it. Yeah, and you're like, oh my God. But uh, my, I know my first name is Steven. That's the oh, one yes. that terrified me to my core. Yep. And there's another, that's, then there's the the Ryan Walsh, not the Ryan Walsh, John Walsh's kid. Yes. Uh, the other one, the, I forget what that TV movie was called. I, I do um, too. That's the one where he gets like burned in the bed. And I know my first name is Stephen, I think is Corn Nemec. Yes, it was. Say. It was. And that was horrifying. Now you're not thinking about the burning bed, are you? No, with, with uh, <laughs> I'm always thinking about the burning bed. <laughs> that that uh, was another one yeah. that I should not have seen yeah, at that Farrah age. Yeah, Farrah Fawcett, a rape revenge movie. It, uh, getting her head slammed into, like, those beating scenes were so real. Yeah. And it was like people were just discovering at that time that spousal abuse, domestic abuse was this real thing, and here's what's yeah. really happening to people. There's one with Jacqueline Smith, who, by the way, on Friday night is doing an appearance at a Sears and Torrance. What? Yeah, for free. <laughs> She'll sign everything. <laughs> yes. she's there. Uh, I think I'm going to go. But um, <laughs> she was in this made for TV movie. I can't remember the name of it, but there's an abusive husband and he, there's a scene where he shoves her into the shower and like burns her, like just scalds her. And then the makeup job after is ridiculously realistic. Oh, and she's no. all like, I, the vision of that is still burned in my head and horrifying. And this was just on at like eight o'clock on a Monday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was that and PSAs. Like there was a bunch of PSAs that also completely scarred me. Yes. There was one for AIDS. No, it wasn't for AIDS. It was about AIDS. It was against It wasn't pro AIDS. <laughs> uh, I've never been able to find it again, but it was this very slow. There was a guy in a hospital bed and it, the camera sort of slowly pushes in and then he looks like the guy in the bed in seven almost. You yes. Know? And it's slow and you think he's dead and it's scary. And it slowly goes around the bed. And when it gets to the other side, he jumps up into the camera. And then it's like, it's, like, it's just like, it's all oh, it's, it's bad. It's coming at you. Yeah. And I literally remember like yelling and like reeling back from the TV. I was so horrified by Fuck. that. It was horrific. I think that may have been regional because I don't remember that at all. We're missing these made for TV movies and and some of them are horrific, Uh, (laughs) but I feel like a lot of those, like their heart was in the right place. Like the people who made bill weren't like, 
<laughs> this is gonna be so fucking funny. No, no, no. <laughs> it was yeah. totally like you need to acknowledge what the lifestyle can be yeah. if you're in this position and people either taking advantage or people looking out for uh, my name is William Bill for short. Yes. But also just like that there, yeah, that kind of humanity aspect. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, like to what we were talking about with like the Cheers thing, I feel like nobody, this will be my old man uh, yelling at clouds thing, but like <laughs> kids now don't, aren't able to watch things with context and intent in mind. It's, it's, it's very, they, they tend to watch things on a very superficial level f- for their barrier to like shut something down. Yes. Done. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of value in stuff like that where someone who is a little more sensitive or savvy or smarter now could tackle movies like that mm-hmm. in a better way, but would never revisit the source material because of the way that it was done originally. Yeah. And that's kind like, I feel like we're losing something because of that. Did you ever see... I don't know. I think this may have been out of New York, but there was a show called How's Your News? Yes. It, uh, it's out of Massachusetts. Was it? Yeah. Um, Boston 0, 0, yep. 1, 2, yep. 3, 3, 4. Yep. Uh, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> Did you ever write a story into Zoom? No, but I watched Zoom yeah. was like almost like older kids when yeah. I watched it. It was it, it was like, this is what older kids do when they get together. I was in love shirts. with it. Yeah. I feel like, was John Ennis on Zoom? They did a remake of Zoom in the early 2000s. and oh, He might have been in the original. They I, shot it in Boston. It was WGBH, so it's possible. I feel like he had a story about somehow having a Zoom he experience. It's funny. I've So many people I know that are comics or actors wrote stories into Zoom. Because they used to do the thing where you'd write a story and they'd act it out. Yes. Amy Poehler wrote stuff into Zoom. James Urbaniak wrote stuff into Zoom. <laughs> and GBH has them all. They have every letter they ever got. Wow. And I'm like, if you could dig up those, it would just be uh, That would amazing. be an amazing yeah, special. you'd still make them. That would um, be the best idea. Yeah. But How's Your News, I loved. It's I so loved. good. Yeah. And it's so good. And it's also that kind of thing of um, people... It was the same... Uh, do you remember on... Um, Sunny, whatever the called heights. Um, uh, God damn it! The Australian guy that played oh, all summer the heights high, summer yeah. heights high. When he was doing the the blackface. <laughs> no, when he was the um, he was the theater teacher that had the oh, assistant yep. who was developmentally disabled. <laughs> yeah, but he kept being really mean to yes. her and all that stuff. And it was like she was completely in on the joke and was playing this character. That was one of my favorite things. It's yeah. like it's inclusive and it gives the person the respect of I'm making this choice to play this. Yeah. There's no it's not condescending. Yeah. I'm not they don't they didn't tell me this is real and it's not a practical joke on me. No. Yeah. I, it's a, we're in this thing and I'm playing a part. Yes. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I love Toji News. There, a lot of the interviews there um, were in Harvard Square like the one where he keeps asking the guy if he likes Friday chicken <laughs> and the guy just goes actually we quote this all the time it's this weird old man and he goes oh excuse me do you like fried chicken and the guy goes i gotta catch a train <laughs> he has the weirdest <laughs> voice it's fantastic it's it is amazing though when you see people who can't handle they're the yes. ones that have the weird they're the ones acting weird that's their disability yes and yeah, it's yeah. so but it's so true and, it and watching that kind of over and over again and watching like the were they students or what yeah like, they were all at this one school and the the guy who ran the school there was a media class so we had them do like man in the street and they were like learning how to do these kind of things and they put the shows together themselves and that kind of stuff it was the best <clears throat> yeah and they were so proud of what they were making and uh yeah and it's sometimes people watch things the wrong way too yes um but it's the same things like the kids of Whitney High, that music teacher who had like done all that stuff. Yeah. Those kids, but those kids wrote those songs themselves and recorded songs, and you know, and some of them are funny on purpose, like they're making jokes in the songs. Yes. It's, but it's people get very uncomfortable. Well, yeah, because I think people assume everyone's a bad person that's going to be awful, or yeah. you know, everyone's snickering behind their hand or whatever. And I think like in How's Your News, the more you watch it, the more. Um, the kids that are doing those Man in the Street interviews are the norm. And you're watching these quote-unquote normal people have these weird reactions or just yeah. really not handle themselves or be super rude or be really condescending where you're yeah. just like, you are the ones that need to learn so badly. Yeah. They go to a demolition derby. And and my favorite thing is one of them, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's interviewing one of the car drivers. And he goes, why do you do this? <laughs> and I'm like, 
Yeah. yeah. Like, this guy's just driving cars into each other. And he has, and that guy's all, like, uncomfortable. And I'm like, no, he's right. Why are you doing this? Yes. And it's You're having a moments. real conversation. Yeah. yeah. And that's why, like, uh, I've revisited A Living Color. Uh, and it's so hateful and lazy. Yeah. And, uh, and Handyman being the prime example of, I remember liking that show when I was a kid. Still being kind of like, hmm. But rewatching that, I'm like, this the joke here is literally that this guy's handicapped. It's not that he's handicapped and people underestimate him and he always is the actual smartest guy in the room, or like their reaction to him, it's like there's a handicapped guy who thinks he's a superhero, he fell down, laugh at him, and it's it it really made me feel like bad as a human being. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm like, people loved this. Yeah. And I started watching the other sketches too, and like uh Fire Marshal Bill and that and I'm like this is just like a guy who's a burn victim. Like, yeah. that's it. That's yeah. the whole concept of the sketch. It's horrifying. Yeah. And it, like, uh, and I've heard people complain about like the, um, what's the Mr. Show sketch where uh, David, his, his parents are both retarded, the Dewey something story. Oh, right. Runner. Yeah. Um, Dewey Cox. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's clearly like a parody of the movies we've been talking about. Right. But there are people who are like, oh, we're laughing at the people. And it's like, not really though. Like it's, it's it's a it's such a de- it's a inter- such a internal comment on it's like you kind of have to know the reference to make yeah. sure that you're laughing at the right thing because if you're taking it's the same way that like Mary, um, married with children they were like it's satire and it's I remember. I was in college when that show got super popular and I'd be like, that's fucking garbage. And they'd yeah. be like, no, it's satire. And it's like, you can tell yourself it's satire because you're smart enough to say that phrase. Yeah. Everybody else that's loving it and making those numbers go up, do not see it as satire. I call that show poor face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not the plight of like blue collar people. It's no. like they're dumb and they're all sharing a lima bean and it's just, ugh, yeah. But also he, he, on that show, that was like the thing that offended me the most is this guy is not good looking. No. This guy is not charming. This guy has nothing going on. Pig's His stunning. wife is amazing <laughs> yeah, looking. Yeah, yeah, she has the best body. She's hot and she's horny for him and he's just like disgusting. <laughs> We're like, what are we doing? Is yeah. this for 11 year old boys? Yeah. Like this is insane. It's a new show, Girls Are Icky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like the no ma'am stuff they had where he had that. I'm like, you, this show's now like the alt right Bible. Yes. <laughs> like basically, is what Married with Children is. It really is. And I think it's it, it started like the comment on of like, this is the way we're making s- sitcoms. But then they were like, no, no, this works. Let's just make sure yeah. that we keep on saying, women, shut your mouths. We're well, just like, what the fuck is this? Well, early days of Fox, when they uh fox when they first started remember was they called it fox weekend television because <laughs> they was only on the weekends oh and yeah they would they rented time on various vhf stations and their big show the, like the show they put all their money into was werewolf <laughs> if you remember werewolf. <laughs> no werewolf was basically incredible hulk but a kid gets turned into a werewolf and chuck connors is an evil sea captain who's the alpha werewolf that he's trying to hunt down to <laughs> kill him to free himself of the curse they put so much money into the show it's <laughs> terrible evil sea captain. yeah yeah he literally is with an eye patch and he's like i'm the original werewolf <laughs> like he's got this he has awful. to take rivers everywhere yeah. because oh it's so it's like this this college kid i think he was a soap actor and he's all it was basically incredible hulk but like he's trying to it was it's wonderfully talented. I have to look that it, up. You got to see Werewolf. Um, but they put all this money in and it bombed. And then the two, and the other show was a sitcom called Mr. President with George C. Scott. And Ed <laughs> Weinberger created it. And it was George C. Scott as the president, Conrad Bain. Um, uh, what's her name? The uh, actress, she's a um, very funny musical actress. She's in all the Mel Brooks stuff. Oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, such with an M. She's yes. deceased. Um, M- Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn. Um, so, like, big names and it's a sitcom about the president and his family and George C. and it bombed they put a ton of money in and the two shows that were huge hits were America's Most Wanted which was an afterthought <laughs> yeah they were like oh we got like a tax break for this show or something <laughs> well three shows America's Most Wanted Cops because it was super cheap like yeah. the guy who had the idea for that was brilliant because ride-alongs are free and you have the right to go on them <laughs> That's so, so he smart. Figured out you could film them and you don't have to pay anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you just get those people who need yeah. bail money anyway to sign yeah, away their. Sign uh, and Married with Children, which was their, la- like, a total throwaway show. Yeah. And they 
didn't have a voice for a network, so they were like, all our shows are married with children now. And they had these horrible shows, like they had a show- Remember where, Babes? Babes was exactly what I was going to talk about. Sorry, but we used to watch clips of Babes in the, the last like three writing jobs ago, and I remember when Babes came out, I was like, I was horrified, because I was like, as a fat girl, this is not going to work for, like, I can't yeah. look at this. And then it was like, well, they signed up, it's their show. So I was thinking, oh, the comedy is going to be like pro them, watching the these clips in this writer's room it was just like holy fucking and Wendy shit Joe Sperber, who's so funny so funny so talented and all the jokes are like have another pie a fat pig seriously like, it's like what and the, the name of the show is an ironic insult to the main cast yeah uh they got a lot of crap for that when it was on yeah that can't that was off like within a year right they retooled it and uh with and they made a big deal out of it they were like no more fat jokes Literally, like there's an article in the TV guy I was reading last week about it. <laughs> and, and people were like, oh, I don't like it now. But they also had a show called Women in Prison that was, <laughs> it was like, I always joke that it's like the store brand show. <laughs> they were like, we don't need a name, just Women in Prison. Yeah, exactly. It was just a horrible. Uh, but was that based on the Australian no, series? No, uh, Tannoy or whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, this was, this was just like a sitcom Oh, god awful! Three oh, camera no. sitcom, women in prison. Uh, <laughs> oh then they god. then they had a show that uh, <laughs> this show was uh, oh boy, whoops! Uh, it was called Whoops, <laughs> and it was about post nuke. No. Yep. These people all. Wait, in I'm cabin. having like a weird recovered memory as you describe. Was yeah. the was the um the mushroom cloud in the opening? Credits? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was like a feminist who you know was like, hey, we Birkenstocks, and then there was like a cool black dude uh. and a fat guy who was always looking for food, <laughs> and like a closeted gay guy, and it was just like, and they're all like in a bunker. They all live in this like cabin in the woods. Oh and there's shit. Like, there's a Thanksgiving episode where there's like a mutated turkey that's trying to it's you cannot believe it's a show that someone was like yeah yeah th- put this on it yep. makes sense i bet you it's like it was probably two years after remember when threads was on oh god and the d- the day after yeah. the morning after Threads just came out on blu-ray and a friend of mine was like i'm gonna buy it i'm like don't watch that don't movie. watch it it's not fun that's another one that uh, threads used to be they used to run commercials for threads during the cartoon like 3 p.m to 5 yeah. p.m on our on our local station and I rem- I watched so many commercials for Threads where it would be like an old lady screaming and crying and they're all yeah. in the subway or whatever. I was like, uh, what the fuck is this? I've talked so many people out of watching that because I go, here's the end of the movie. A lady sells her body for three dead rats to eat. Oh, <laughs> and they're like, so oh, dark. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not like, it's not even like Mad Max fun. No. Yeah. No, no, no. This is like, this is... Prepare for this as your future life, drinking out of the toilet, yep. trying to shoot your neighbor so you can get his toilet water. It was dark. Did you ever see Testament? No. Was it along the same lines? Yeah. Lucas Haas, one of the first things he did, he's a little kid actor, and he's such a good actor. Like, he's so sympathetic. He's so good. The premise of the movie is based on a play. Uh, is uh, A-bomb goes off far enough away that these people don't die instantly, but they're just dying of radiation poisoning in their house. And it's a mother and son and she, and he dies first. Cause he's, and it's like an, it was a PBS thing. Oh, okay. And it's, it's brutal. Is it, um, did it get filmed? It almost looks like a play. that yeah. been been, reco- okay. Yeah. Yes. It's yes. like in one set and it's just brutal. And then there's when the wind blows. If you've ever seen that. <laughs> no. Animated. No. Made by the guy who made the snowman. David Bowie soundtrack. It's these two <laughs> cute little old British uh, couple. Bomb goes off. They're they're convinced because they survived World War II. They're like, oh, they're going to come save us. And it's literally just them dying of radiation poisoning for an hour and a half. I'm having weird, like, <laughs> little sp- spits and spats of, like, oh. clips of that. Yeah. Of them huddled together. Yep, they're a little round, cute. And it is... They showed us that in school, <sighs> and I'm like, no, no, I know that it's bad. Wait, like, the day after was like that, right? Except for it was just in a single. It was single camera. Uh, yeah, it was. It was a. It was a. I think it was NBC, and yeah, it was a made-for-TV movie. Um, it was such a problem. People were so freaked out that Reagan came on TV the next night to talk about it. Ugh. The president had to go on TV and be like, hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah, everybody calmed down. But, yeah. but the thing was, at that time, that 
I mean, I I never thought about it until very recently, like in the you know times we live in now. We are, yeah. That I we really did. I grew up under the threat of nuclear war on a daily basis, and we just kind of it was like, well, yeah, that's how it is. Like there was no other way it could be, which is such a strange thing to look back on now. I really, I was trying to, I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, and uh, it was bothering me that younger people don't seem as terrified, and I was thinking that it has to be because of all the apocalyptic media they've seen that makes it look cool yes like even walking dead or something it's like awesome it's like a video game and i'm like no 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 no." yeah (laughs) like like there's a an amazing british show called survivors that they remade a couple years ago but it was 70s and there's a pandemic 95 percent of the world's dead and the that's the first episode and there's a scene that chills me to my bones still this day where this woman who was like a tennis playing upper middle class woman whole family's dead she's like scavenging in a house and this old guy's in there and he's dying um and he makes this speech where he picks up a light bulb and he goes do you know how this works she's like no and he goes this is thousands of years of man learning how to, you know, goes through how it works and how you can make the glass and everything. And he's like, nobody knows how to do this now. Uh. You don't have a light bulb anymore because we all took for granted like what we had. And, and I remember seeing it as a kid and just being like, oh. like I was like, oh my God, this guy's speech about a light bulb. But it's so true. And I don't think they're getting stuff like that. No. Even not the visceral like threads was so brutal. But even that kind of thing where it's like, dude, you're not going to have your phone. You're going to be drinking toilet water. And like, you're going yeah. to have constant diarrhea and yeah. your skin's going to fall off. And you might die from the diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so dark. Um, uh Right, shit, as we were talking about that, it just another one of those things popped into my head. Special Bulletin? Did you ever see that? No. Oh, it's great. It's the guys that did 30-something in my so-called life. It's the first thing they ever did, and it's presented like a real news program. Oh, and God. it looks like TV this news. Is like, they're like, oh, this could be one step more stressful. Yeah. yeah, and so it's presented. You think it's a news broadcast, and then the war breaks out. Ugh. And it's a real time. It was made for TV movie, but it's in real time, and it, it's... They were influenced, obviously, by like War of the Worlds and stuff. But it is so well done and horrifying. God. And it's and it should be. Yes, it should. <laughs> like be. It should be because that's what. Oh, that's what it was. Berlin eighty three. Did you see that? No, series? I've never seen it. No, it's a German show, and it's basically about the time where when the um like the nuclear crisis was at its apex, and essentially how these soldiers that were from East Germany and they were all convinced. Look, the they're going to bomb us. We have to do it first. And it was that all that Ugh. thinking in the in the East German military. Military. Um, and basically it was, and this is the truth, they say, at the time, so this is like, you know, 1983 or yeah, whatever, yeah. it was the music that got through to the East Berlin side that made like 99 Luft Balloons yep. and all those songs that David were like, Hasselhoff. yes, <laughs> the Hoff got in yep. there. Um or Major Tom, yep. those songs, where then the young people in East Germany started going, they don't want this to happen. Yeah. We, we've we been told that they want this to happen, they're going to do they it. And, us, yeah. and basically they were like, we can't bomb them because we don't think they want to We they want to bomb us for real. We we're being yeah. lied to. Well, it's did, unbelievably stressful. Did you see Atomic Blonde? No. Actually, it, people hated it, but it, it takes place in 89 in Berlin. And that kind of factors in a little bit because the sort of mole spies on the East German side are all these like raver kids. Yeah. Who was like, eh, it's not a big deal. So it must be, you know, b- based on that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it bothers me that there aren't people like afraid of that all the time. Right. And I, I guess it's a better world because it's awful to wake up terrified every day, although I have been. Um, but even something like War Games. Yeah. Like oh my that, god. That movie where you're like, oh, it's a fun romp with Ferris Bueller, and, and you're like, no, this. The ending of that movie is brutal. It's crazy. And Dabney Coleman's so good at that movie. He's so good. Well, and also it's just so. Um, nobody understood video games, and nobody understood what the fuck was going on yeah. with true nuclear war. So yeah. the idea of it was so believable. Yeah. And so horrifying. Although, like my favorite comedy of all time is Real Genius. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things I love the most about it is. There's real stakes in it. Yeah. And the sort of heist aspect has a purpose. Yeah. And you really did go, the military is like just killing people. Yeah. (laughs) And and, and then, you know, the whole thing we, growing up too, 
Vietnam vets were in everything. Right. And it was always like shell shocked people and it was horrible. And I don't think we get that about like the Iraq war. No, no. Although the Punisher did. I don't know if you saw the Punisher. It's, it's, uh, I saw, I think I saw the first episode of it. It gets real. It's about PTSD. The whole thing. Really? And it, there's like a shell so- shocked Iraqi war vet who's going to blow people. Like it's, it's really like these people got fucked up. Yeah. It's wrong. Yeah. And it was, it was the first thing I'd seen in recent memory that I was like, Oh, this is, this is the sort of message of that stuff. And we're, we're missing those sort of, I mean, that's a little on the nose, but we're missing the sort of allegory shows. Yeah. Like, I feel like shows like The Twilight Zone made us better people. Yeah. <laughs> like a generation better people. But I feel like people have so many choices these days that it, it's like, we didn't have any choice but to yes. watch fucking threads. If yeah. you were home, you had three channels to watch, and it was like, you would just kind of pick what you pick. And once you start watching it, like, you're watching the whole thing. <laughs> yes. But but these days, you know, if it were me, I'd be like, no, 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 turn on an old episode of The Simpsons. I can't yeah. watch that. Yeah. And I think that's what most people and growing up these days it's like when I hear millennials or younger people go- going like this gave me all the feels it's like you don't need to be that afraid of feelings yeah. it's just have them and then walk away it's yeah. not like you don't have to like go into a complete infantilism right. just because something is making you have a reaction <laughs> you feel surrogates yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're yeah. okay just have them do you ever get that with people that listen to your podcast that are like to romanticize the murder stuff or like no we uh, the thing that we get that i think is the coolest thing and completely unexpected is how everybody thought because they were into true crime they were super weird and they were the only ones right and it's truly like thousands of people who thought they were the only ones yeah so they're all having this experience now of like me meeting people in their town meeting people that they worked with meeting people we hear it Every time we go out and do live shows and there are people in the VIP, yeah. they tell us, like, we didn't even know each other at work. And then one of us, we heard one say SSDGM yeah. to the other or whatever. Like, and these things of people keeping their interest to themselves, because they, especially women, they yeah. think it's creepy or <coughs> gross of me to right. like true crime. Because they're, they're not like, oh, it's awesome. They did this. Like, they're not fixating on the, 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 gore of it or the grew of it exactly which i think uh it's w- when i was first started getting interested in it and like say the true crime um trading cards came yeah, out yeah. i remember when that was a big and th- that was like the tipper gore era where yeah. they were constantly trying taboo. to tell everybody yeah. you're what you like is wrong and you're being exploitive or whatever and i think now people are coming to realize it's like er- somebody else's opinion of what this is has nothing to do with the way i'm taking it right. in right and you can't just tell me that simply by liking this i I'm being disrespectful. Right. I'm actually incredibly respectful and to the point where I'm holding this story as like this experience that someone had that is important to me too. It's not forgotten. No. Like their their the sacrifice or whatever what they went through is not forgotten. Or, right. And yeah. I'm one of those kind of people that I don't ever want to hear a serial killer talk. I never listen no. to the interviews. I yeah. don't read their books. That's not I what they did uh I don't care about their brains or their personalities, except for like, this does happen. It's almost yeah. like if you got a, a tumor and it would make you do that. To yeah. me, that's how I see it. Right. And then it's the impact of this, you know, this person victimized this person in this way. And then either something good came out of it or, it, you know, there was all this suffering or somebody survived it. Right. Or we have a new law because of it or yeah. something. Like, because that's the thing growing up with boys and like punk rock kids and stuff, the sort of fetishization of like Joe Wayne Gacy, dude, buy yep. his painting. Yep. And like, Oh, it's, it's the music that whatever. And I'm just yeah. like, Fuck off. Like that's awful. Yeah. Well, and it's fake. Yeah. It's like that thing of like, can you believe? Because I had a little bit of that as a young stand up comedian. When I first got into stand up comedy, all the comics I met, all also loved that shit. So yeah. we could talk about Ed Gein all day long. Yeah. And I held it as this point of pride of like, yeah, the boys think I'd be scared of this, but I can I'm play not. Ball. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which is like, it's just at the end of the day of interest where it's like, you know, the movie psycho it's based on a real person. Yeah. Here's this real person. He fucking drank out of skulls and had <laughs> soup bowls and Dug all this up shit. his mom. And yeah, like all, all those things that seem beyond like fiction are actually based in reality. Yeah. And are why didn't anyone tell me this earlier? Yeah, I, I, I've always liked horror movies, and I've always like I had a Fangoria subscription, all that sure. stuff. And like I remember going to see Henry Portrait of Serial Killer, oh. and being just 
like gut punched after that movie, which I think is how you're supposed to watch that movie. Yeah. You know, you're just supposed to be like, ugh. And I never want to watch it again. I right. watched it. And it but people were like, fuck yeah, it's awesome. And I'm like, do you? No, no. Like, yeah. I've, I've, it was great to see how this sort of worked. But I don't want to see that again. I think those are, those are like early sociopath tests that we didn't know people Probably. were taking. Where yeah. it's just like, oh, so you walked out of that movie a fan of his work? Yeah, you okay. thought that was the you you thought he was an Archie Bunker <laughs> type who was misunderstood, and you got yeah. It's it's very weird how that stuff and like I hate I, I haven't seen much of it, but like the blacklist. What I've seen of it. It's that like super smart serial killer who's charming and you know like that like Wait, what is this show? It's the one with James Spader and he's supposed to be like a Hannibal Lecter type. <laughs> oh, oh. And they, I haven't like, watched that at oh, all. God. I watched like one episode and the the premise is he's like basically Hannibal Lecter. Okay. And they're like there is a rash of bad people and we need you to help us and he's like <laughs> i'll help you but you have to do something for me like just this ridiculous fedora yeah yeah and yeah. i'm just like no no they're not like superheroes who are misunderstood and they're like use your powers for good yeah. like that's not how it works they would never do that yes and it's it's that stuff i'm just like Ugh. and i don't like that those are the portrayals we get in like fiction stuff. Yeah. Um, whereas I love like Manhunter is one of my favorite movies ever. Incredible. Because Dollahides, you feel sad for him, yes. sort of. But you're like, no, he's irredeemable. Like this is a monster. Well, and you get why. Like there, the way that's laid out is so great. Thomas Harris is a fucking genius. I mean, the fact that he's written these, this series of books that people that that have been like culturally relevant for thirty years. Yeah. It's amazing. But like that to me is the best example of like Francis Dollarhide. You go, I get what's happening with you. Your your psychosis is making sense to me. I understand yep. why you want to transition from this flaw you know encasement as yep. you see it in you you're going to become the red dragon like all those things are that's the fascination to me it's a psychological kind of fascination it's not like hooray that you're knifing yeah. people Fucking also. but yeah. but those um like the way that's laid out like the it's families yeah. and he's doing it for these reasons and the mirrors and he thinks he's helping them like yes. they're part of the like that it's it's the kind of thing where and comedy's this way too, I think, uh, where dumb people see someone skilled doing something that's very difficult and landmines. Yeah. And they go, I can do that. And then they do it wrong and focus on the wrong parts. And other dumb people go, that's how you do it. Yeah. And then you sort of <laughs> get that now. Whereas it's like, no, that's really hard to present a character like that just right yes and and it, that's why we don't have a lot of it and it's the the character that like the the parts that i love where um what's that fucking hot guys who played the cop oh william peterson yes yeah i met him i was once. gonna say tom berenger but he yeah. is like he's like the thinking woman's tom berenger oh, he's basically yeah. he's amazing you met him i met him he when he was doing csi um, when I worked at CBS in Boston, he was doing like a, um, you know, he was coming to do a promo thing. And I was his like, because I was basically an intern, I was like, had to just go for for the day. But I brought my Manhunter laser disc <laughs> and he signed it and he signed my To Live and Die in LA soundtrack. Oh, but it was like super cool because he's just, I think he was in Steppenwolf. He was a Chicago guy, like yeah. actor and he, he was just like super cool and just was like really proud of those movies and was just like awesome. Manhunter, no matter day or night, no matter where I click on, if I flip on a Manhunter, I'm watching the rest of it. I find that movie weirdly comforting. Yes, because those blues, when those shots, I mean, it's... Um, it's beautiful. It's so gorgeous to look at, and it's really calming, and then when the other scenes come in, you're like, I'm so upset right now. Yeah, yeah. Like, it lulls you into the calm, and then boom. But there's all those parts where it's like, it's this guy that this this whole process is so specific to him and it's so personal to him that these tiny things that like um william peterson is doing to manipulate dollar high yeah. to get him to come out like that is so such brilliant yeah. right implying that he's gay yes. and like when he puts that face fake thing and he's like no that's not what i'm doing yes yeah it's amazing and i still say brian cox is such a better lector because he's dangerous yeah brian cox will beat the shit out like he's <laughs> really scary like yeah. he's a big dude and he, he he looks like he's thinking and anthony hopkins just isn't intimidating 
Anthony Hopkins, but but the way Jonathan Demme shot that movie, like the first moment, and I mean, it also just coming from my point of view, the character of Clary Starling was such a fucking revelation and yeah. so thrilling to see, to be first a firsthand kind of get it to be the first person shooter in a movie yeah. as Clary Starling. I got to be the, like, yeah. I get to be the hero of right. a movie. And you never saw that aside from the movie Feds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Gross, really for like everything you've yeah. done for our culture. But when she walks up and then it's you walking up and it's him standing yeah. there, like, so calm and British. I don't know. I, everything about that movie. You've been to the worked. Hollywood Museum? No. They have the whole set. No. That his cell set, not just his cell, the hallway, the basement of that building. It's the old Max Factor building on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, yeah, yeah. The basement, they have the little office. It's the entire set from Sounds of the Lamb. No fucking so way. So you walk down. Yeah, I'll show you pictures. I was there last. It's all three cells with Lecter at the bottom and the chair. And you walk in and it's in the basement and you walk into that room. No way. It's the set. Ugh. It's really cool. It's, I mean, that movie's so brilliantly shot yeah. too. Yeah, but then, and then you had Hannibal, which was insanity that, with the brain. Fr- I was like, no, 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 guys, no. We've gone so far from Manhunter. Also, you cannot switch starlings. I'm no. sorry. It's as like, much as I like Julianne Moore, it, she's not the same character. No, it has to be Jodie Foster. It just yeah. that's who it is. Yeah, I Manhunter. I always wanted the other Michael Mann TV stuff he did to capture that and there are times on miami vice where it almost is yes and crime story has some great episodes that are almost no, i never watched that crime story is i always call it mad men miami vice <laughs> it's dennis farina's the main guy okay and yes, it takes yes. place in the 60s okay. first season's new york second season's las vegas and it's about the fbi busting up these criminals wow <laughs> and michael it's michael mann's show is it mostly mafia stuff Mostly mafia stuff. I hate but mafia the, stuff. I hate mafia stuff. I hate Scarface. I hate Godfather. I just hate it. It's just sociopaths shooting each other. Yeah. And being greedy. And again, it's that thing people are like, so fucking awesome. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> no, I haven't watched The Sopranos. I hate all the McMob movies they shoot in Boston. Like yes. people, Anyone who tells me Boondock Saints is their favorite movie, <laughs> like I never want to see you <laughs> again. Saints. Like, Come like on. That, Wahlburgers is basically Boondock Saints, the burger place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Boondock Burger. So perfect. Yes, the biggest full circle. Yeah, there's no, fu- there's no, fu- except for I will say, uh, uh, Boardwalk Empire, because it was a period piece, and because of Steve Buscemi, who God bless him forever, I will yeah. never not love him so much. Um, but also those guys that played Al Capone and yeah. all those people, Meyer Lansky, they were so believable and real and beautiful in those suits and those conversations and yeah. everything about it, like. Uh, because I'm such a big period piece person, that was the one time where where Mafia didn't bug me because right. it was like you really were getting to know the people. Yeah, like I've gone in the North End in Boston. There's literally Italian restaurants that like have TVs playing The Godfather. <laughs> and I'm like, do you know what this is about? Like, yeah. this is not... This isn't good for you. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not like, a celebration. No, what are you doing? Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's very strange with that. But do you have a favorite period piece TV show? I mean, the very first one that comes to mind is Little House on the Prairie. We grew up with it, and we loved it so much. And we, I've told the story before, but my dad had his favorite joke would be at the like the third commercial break when it would be like this second act break right. when the worst thing would be happening: yeah. a child would be dying of malaria or whatever. <laughs> malaria. Uh, it was rarely <laughs> everyone malaria. had rickets. Um, <laughs> well, when they went to Africa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Remember. <laughs> Um, but we would always be crying like in three quarters of the way through it. And my dad would come in every time and go, you, we got to turn this off. It's too sad. And we'd be like, no, dad, no. But we'd be sobbing every single week. And I, I mean, I loved that show. Do you remember the mime rape episode? Yes. I mean, I'll never, (laughs) this is like that mime rape goes in the threads. There's the, the bill for short. There's all these things where like, I have like living slides of these things in my brain. And they didn't. They didn't warn you. Yes. Like you knew you knew that show would be sad every <laughs> week, right? So you're expecting sad. Yes. You're not expecting mime rape. No. And it's it, it's traumatic. I feel like one of the reasons you can't do that now is people maybe are just more humane. I don't know. Yeah. But I think they'd probably be like, 
We will be sued into oblivion. Yes, because children shouldn't be watching that. And that there were so many levels on that episode because Albert, that was another one. He he slipped into the, the Scott Baio yeah. category, yeah. but he was like the sensitive library of Scott Baio. Like if Scott Baio was a jock, he right. was a nerd. But I loved Albert. I mean, like, and also Albert was so sensitive that he was going to have the pregnant new girl be his girlfriend because yeah. everyone was attacking her and he was going to take care of it all. The the idea of all of that, like there's there's one scene I'm pretty sure where that the mime face comes into a window, yeah, and it is like the it's scariest thing. It's a commercial break scene. Yes, <laughs> and it's like on it's like on par with the strangers. It's yeah. so fucking scary. Yeah, and it, it's just on TV. Yeah, on your eight o'clock Sunday night. Mime, <laughs> uh, what is it? A, um, a Harlequin mask. Yeah, because the circus is coming through town, <laughs> and so this guy's like a roaming rapist yes. in the circus, and it's almost like something wicked this way comes. Yeah, and yeah, and then the dad, and then they murders him at the end. Yes, with the shotgun. Right, because was that guy with the circus, or was it the dad himself? I think doing it was it? the dad himself who. I, I haven't rewatched it for good reason, but he might have been like pretending he was with the circus thing to get away with it. Yes, it was, oh, because God. it was the layer was like there. There was a preteen girl who was pregnant, so yep. there was an incest layer. Yep. There was a rapist layer, yep. and then it all was like it, it was the it was an incest reveal to the rapist storyline. Yeah, and that's how they pitched it in the writers' room. I'm, and they're like, <laughs> but hold on, yep. Harlequin mask. Yeah. How about the circus comes to town and they go <laughs> to the fair? I love, I that love it. That sounds nice. That sounds like a normal little house. I'm spot. not done. Okay. <laughs> Girls pregnant through incest and a mime rape. <laughs> There's one of my favorite things on the internet is is called um, 30 Second Little House on the Prairie. Yes. Did, have you seen that? I've seen Someone that episode cut, of that. Cut them up? Yeah. Ugh, they do the mime one in 30 seconds. Yes. yes. Yeah. There's that, the, that one is just horrifying. There's the one where everyone gets um, typhoid. Yes. Because of the rats in the mill. Oh my god, that one is hilarious. Because they keep going boiling. Like they're using the worst sound effects yeah. to like boil it down. Inappropriate sound effects. Fantastic. <laughs> That's a very slow show. And I feel yes. like we can't I, there's nothing even close to that pace. No. Even way. historical stuff. No. I, and I wonder if you made a show like that, if people would watch it. I mean, it would I feel like these days it would almost be like, have you seen slow TV? No. It was like that. It's out of Norway, I believe, okay. or Sweden. I think it's Norway. But basically, for the 100th anniversary of their train system, they put tr a camera on the front of their train, and they had a live shot <laughs> of this train taking this the historic route that yeah. it's taken. And everyone in the country watched it. It was like the highest rated thing ever. So they started making what they call slow TV. So the next thing they did was they put a camera on the front of a boat and had it go up the fjords or whatever and everyone watched that and it was like basically the exact opposite of modern entertainment right. where you're literally just taking a, a real-time train ride where people would come out of their house and wave to the camera me, yeah. and and like you're like oh my god it's a it's on netflix now it's to check it out the sensation of it is so amazing and hilarious because you're like this is only going to be like this the whole time, but then you start, your brain slows down, and then you start looking for the things that are, like, exciting about it. Yeah. And it's um, it's really interesting. It's really amazing. Did you watch the new Twin Peaks? I didn't. Okay. Did you like the original? I did like the original, but it was a little too... Um, you know the part where Grace Sabrinsky's just screaming? Yes. Like... <laughs> oh, the whole thing? <laughs> like that? Yeah. I liked the, you know, some elements of it, but that the the really scary dark weirdness the yeah. david lynchness yeah. of it got to me too much then don't watch the new one okay because uh, it's that times a thousand okay but the cool thing about it was it's very slow oh like there's whole scenes there's a five minute scene of a guy sweeping <laughs> literally there's one episode ends with a guy sitting down and eating soup and you see him eat the whole bowl of soup <laughs> and it, it, it's so intentional and weird and they didn't release them all at once so you had to wait a week in between and i kind of realized i was missing that sort of pace yeah and you think about it and you anticipate the next episode and um because you never see anything like that these yeah. days at all and i'm wondering if there's a if there's a market for that because we don't have it or yes. I think so in that in that way of just letting your brain be by itself for a second or just letting your brain 
have like a singular focus and not have it be lights and sounds and craziness. I, right. I was going to say this, though, that I did watch the first two episodes of Tw Twin Peaks when it came out. And the beginning of that show was exactly what I would want on TV. Yeah. It just went off into a thing where I'm like, can we please get back to a girl walking down the railroad tracks like with blue lips? Yeah. I mean, can we get back to the freakiest yeah. beginning of any that show? That weird, dreamlike, the sound, like everything. You couldn't believe they were getting away with it on TV. Yeah. Uh, and and we get very even in the golden age of TV stuff that I watch, I feel like we don't get that sort of we don't get moments we don't get like that you know images of just like a slow like Manhunter I mean there's like yeah th there's beautiful sort of slow moments in that even like in the Inagata De Vida scene you yes know? <laughs> uh, there's still like stuff where you're like it. it that's the stuff I want to see and Twin Peaks sometimes had that in the 90s which you you weren't seeing yeah yeah at a time. It was it was it was an amazing show, but I I just once I realized it wasn't going to be like a straightforward crime procedural right. that there was going to be all this weird bullshit and the, and also the second something becomes symbolic or like I'd uh, film major friends who would be like oh no the clouds are symbols for this Semiotics. I would immediately just be <laughs> yeah. like ah oh, fuck off yeah, I didn't yeah. go to college and freak yeah. out but. Oh, the sad, I still have guilt about this. My friend Lydia and her mom, Lynette, um, I was house sitting for them. They went out of town and they're like, please just record this week's episode of Twin Peaks. And I didn't do it. Intentionally? No, no, no. I just like, I <laughs> fucked up yeah, and yeah. forgot or didn't go over to the house or whatever. It, whatever I did at the time, I was like, God, they're being such, yeah, like, they're such lunatics show. about it. And now I'm like, oh my God, it was like episode five of Twin Peaks. Yeah. And they were like living for it, of course. And they and if they didn't see it, that like people would be like, did you see it? Yeah. Like, no, it no. It wasn't just going to replay. Yeah. It wasn't streaming anywhere. Yeah. Do you have a favorite procedural or like a uh, crime show that you either revisit or watch now or that you think just really gets it right um i mean i'm a huge fan of british procedurals so like yeah. the first season of broad church was mind-blowing and this last season of broad church the one in three i would say i believe there was one in three um it, it's hard to watch because it's so real yeah happy valley same way i loved happy valley and the second season of happy valley is like so incredible even the b plot is like this is amazing because because it's all those british actors yeah. and they're such um they're such good actors that you don't i think here we put up with really shitty acting because we're like oh that person's pretty or yeah. who cares and you go oh, i was just out of it for a little while but now i'm back in whereas the british ones you go into a world and you're there yeah. and i i really love that so i'd say like um you know any like happy valley type of show i guess like and there's a couple of um I Slavic one or not Slavic? What would they be? Icelandic, yeah. Yeah, there's like um, there was one called The Break, I believe. That's about I think it's Danish, and it's like a guy that was a cop and has a nervous breakdown and comes back to his hometown and then starts investigating a local oh, murder. Did, didn't the guy who made the original Vanishing make that show? Oh, maybe. Or that the original Night Watch. Did you ever see that? No. no. Oh, did you ever see the original Vanishing? No. Oh, it's so Wait, good. is Harrison Ford in it? No, it's it's a Dutch movie, and they remade it, and it's not Harrison Ford. I don't think it's Kiefer Sutherland in the remake. Oh, no. And Night Watch is also the same guy, and they remade it with a um, uh, Scottish actor from Transpotting. Um, Ewan McGregor? Ewan McGregor. Okay. And it's, yeah. But the, the original ones are chilling and amazing, and I think the guy who made those has made that tv show oh okay because it's really good <clears throat> yeah and it's all that thing where it's all the people um it's just really good characters and really believable and then this stuff is happening where you know it's like the thing that's really funny to me and a lot of procedurals where you're like it's a small town and now there's been seven murders yeah, like there's what the four fuck people is going? left yeah there's yeah. like this can't be but they handle all that part of it really well and it's just kind of you know small town intrigue or whatever right, but right. i do love I just love a procedural. The um, the tunnel is really good. There's two versions either. of the tunnel. And it's basically there's a murder and they leave the body inside the tunnel. So a French detective has to work on it and a British detective oh, okay. yeah, has yeah. to work on it. It's really good. 
um, I'll just take any any British any uh, decent yeah, British procedural thing. Yeah. yeah. Now I have a large list of things that I have to watch. Yes. <laughs> and that's fine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great. Uh, of talking course. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even get into. We didn't even cra- I know. I'm sorry. We've been chatting for. I will talk to people all night. But uh, yeah, I remember the the one you grabbed on the top there was for a very specific reason. Uh, because oh, because there was a picture of Matt Houston on yes. it, which is hilarious because he was basically poor man's Tom Selleck. Yes. Um, um, and they were it looked it was like they were trying to blend the popularity of Dallas, the nighttime yes. soap, with it's basically they sat in a room and said, How can we get all the popularity of all those things? Yep. And it came out as Matt Houston, which D- didn't no was not long it. lived no one really cared yeah but he looked the part perfectly oh yeah there was a b- weird trend where they were constantly trying to just rejigger the formula of magnum pi like um simon and simon yes they're like two magnum pis yes <laughs> and the brothers and then the one with the what was the one with the boat uh with the three guys and one of them was like a nerd and it was three brothers and it was Oh, I can't. I'll Jake and the Fat Man? Not Jake and the Fat Man, <laughs> which is like Babes. Yes. <laughs> Very offensive to William Conrad. Um, no, it was, it, was, uh, it was like Stingray or something like that, but I can't remember that someone will. And know, they were three crime solving brothers. The three brothers. crime solving brothers that lived on a boat. Uh, two I, of them had mustaches, and one was like the tech nerd one. Uh, it looked like Bill Gates. I bet I would know yeah. that if I if I really thought about it. Oh, oh. But you know what's funny is that they didn't understand what was great about Tom Selleck because right. Tom Selleck was co- almost like he looked like the manliest marble man of all time, yeah. like insanely delicious to look at. And then he was a big sensitive guy. Yeah, and was kind of goofy on the show. Like he would so goofy, not quite Rockford Files, but he would like sometimes get his ass kicked. Yes, like you know, he would. Like, Complain a lot and whine, and he was like, he was, he liked girls, but he didn't always have a ton of confidence. We were like, you're the most good looking man that's ever been invented. You're, don't go up to any woman and talk to her. But he was always like, I'm going to be friends with her and I like her, but I'm, she's going through some stuff. I'm not going to make a move. Like, I don't think they understood that the manliness, like that Tom Selleck was doing this really palatable manliness thing. Yeah. Whereas like Matt Houston was just, from Houston, he was going to yeah. go up your ass with a gun or whatever. Again, it's that sort of dumb person watching a show and going, I get what this is. I could totally reverse engineer this. It's mustaches. <laughs> yeah. It's just all about mustaches, mustaches. and swagger. <laughs> yeah. I think it, I'm pretty sure it's a Magnum PI, but um, Chris Elliott's in an episode as Magnum's Vietnam buddy. No. And uh, he's also in Manhunter. He's Chris Elliott. Yeah, he's the guy who makes the cast of the teeth. He's one oh, of the, yes. Yeah. And I asked, I was like, "What the hell was that about?" And he's got a big beard and everything. Yeah. And he's also way too young to be a Vietnam vet. And he, and he, <laughs> he said that because Letterman was so popular, and he was such a popular person on it, the writers of these shows just wanted him to be in stuff yeah. to like have him around. Yeah. And he was like, "But I'm not. I'm like 25 years old." <laughs> <laughs> and you want me to be his Vietnam buddy? And they're like, yeah, it's fine. Sure. And yeah, same thing with Manhunter. He's just like in both those things randomly. That's so. <laughs> do you remember in the the Abyss? He was the yes. guy that ran the crane or whatever. And my favorite line of any movie is Chris Elliott in the Abyss when Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio gets off the helicopter and he goes, "There she is, Queen Bitch of the Universe." Yeah. And the way he says it is like the funniest there's so much disdain it made me so happy normally i i would hear lines like that in a movie and i'd be like god can we just lay off for one second and it's the most perfectly delivered line he's it's it's funny how and i forget that one he has a funny story that i won't try to retell because i don't remember it but it was it was something about like everyone was terrified of james cameron on that set Mm. and he just didn't give a shit yeah because he was he got cast because they he liked him on letterman or something and he was just like whatever (laughs) and so he would like bust his james cameron's balls or something and everyone was like what are you doing like there was some kind of crazy thing like that which sort of fits in with him reading a line that way yes where he's he's mr nothing to lose that's yeah. the best you that's the guy you want to be in every situation yeah and it, it always works for like the characters they would cast him in but every time i see manhunter it sort of takes me out of it a little <laughs> bit because i'm like chris elliott with a giant beard is the the the, the 
CIA or FBI crime scene guy. He's the one, though, that go- William Peterson like works with him, right? Yeah, yeah. It's when they're at Quantico. Yes. And he's showing them. He goes, yeah, they started calling him the Tooth Fairy. And he's got yes. the dental thing. And he's in it for like a second. And then there's a scene later where they're all around a table. And he's like, yes, yes, I'm paying attention. I remember <laughs> with the most recent time I watched Manhunter, I remember spotting him and going, good job. Yeah. That was actually, you. like, he didn't bring me out of it in a way that I was surprised. I mean, I think because I asked him about it and i was i was kind of like maybe chris Elliott was trying to do like a serious role he did a good job and he's like <laughs> and he's like fuck no it was just kind of like i was like what they just <laughs> wanted like, me around i was the guy from underneath the stairs all right cool <laughs> my favorite one ever of that and then i'll i'm sorry i'm taking your whole night no no is the science fiction one <laughs> he goes he comes out and it's because he was doing those every week yes and they started getting weirder and weirder and he does one where he <laughs> Comes out as a ghost and he goes, Give me my ring back. <laughs> Give me the ring you stole from me. And Letterman goes, Chris, what are you what are you doing? I don't understand. He goes, Oh, Dave, it's science fiction. <laughs> and then he starts having a talk about the genre of the sketch and all this stuff. And he's like, I don't like it. And he's like, No, it's you know, it's, it's like science fiction thing. And he's good. I thought and it's just like this weird and then he goes, no, and then he just goes, he's like, ah, okay. And then he just goes back under the stairs. And it's so funny because it was like, you've done this like 20 times and you're still making it funny. It's, and it's great. The first time I saw it, I used to sneak up to watch Letterman. So I would go to bed. I was probably 11. And then I would get up <coughs> and I would go pull a chair way up close to the TV. Yeah. Yep, and I would have to have it really close. My dad would, my dad caught me like twice. And he'd be like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. It'd be like one in the morning. You get school but, tomorrow. Yes. But I would be right up next to it. And the first time Chris Elliott popped up from under those fucking st- I was like, what in the fuck happens yeah. when I go to bed? Yeah. Like it made me go, I need to figure out what adults do when kids aren't around. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because it seems like it's this awesome. That's the stuff I miss about Letterman because that early stuff was crazy and it felt like it was only for you and conan was like that when it first started yeah doing weird stuff yeah and then he just kind of got old and cranky and it wasn't the same yeah but that bizarre stuff they got away with and a lot of it was chris elliott like when he came out and did rocket man yeah or when he'd come on the show as marlon brando yes. <laughs> they would just introduce him as marlon brando interview it like it was just crazy stuff like that that i'm like i, I don't think a network talk show would let you do that kind of stuff now no not We're, not at all just seemed like guys having fun and doing whatever they want yeah it really <clears throat> seemed like it was four stoned college students yeah. because also those um with those break out or back into commercials when it would just be a camera on the street that would go up into a lighted window that was yeah. like on a, the 15th floor where yeah. it's just someone's apartment yeah like those those kinds of things where as a kid in northern california i was like oh, look what they're doing in manhattan it's like so sophisticated it was thrilling yeah i mean even watching snl was like that for me and you know new york seemed really far away and i yes. i jumped into snl the first season before Lauren michaels came back mm. the maligned season um with anthony michael Hall and yeah, Robert Downey yeah, Jr. <laughs> yeah. And I love the first episode I ever saw live was the one that Paul Rubens hosted. Oh wow. And two of my favorite sketches ever are on that show and it's they're really funny weird sketches but they that was when they had the set look like 42nd street mm-hmm. and it was just had this like weird grimy sleazy thing and like Penn teller would be on yeah and i'd stay up and be like this is the coolest that, like they're just up all night doing weird crazy stuff yeah and uh i I don't know if it was because I was young or if stuff just hasn't recaptured that now, but I there's very few things that I've seen that I feel like even approach that level of like, it's not quite anarchy, but just like you, you're seeing people hanging out and they're having fun and doing weird stuff. Yes. On TV. There was, uh, and then I swear to God, I'll stop talking. No, no, no. But there was, a, um, it's going to take me a second to remember his name, but my aunt used to record HBO specials for us. Mm-hmm. So she would record it. Um, on HBO and then she would decide if it was kid friendly okay. enough and sometimes she would edit them so that we could watch them but like when when um, the Pee Wee special was on yes. she recorded that then there was a guy who was at the Groundlings with Pee Wee Herman with Paul Rubens. John Paragon thank you the, the Paragon, Paragon of, of comedy. comedy okay that special we watched it a hundred times yep. it is the funniest fucking thing it's in the great. world yeah every sketch day old bread sale yep. and, and it's insanity yep. like it's not when you look back now 
It's not the best. I used to think that guy is the funniest person. And he yeah. was on Cheers one time. Yes. He did a walk on on Cheers. And I was like, it's you. Yeah. Like and he co-wrote all of the Elvira stuff with Cassandra. Oh, is that true? Yeah. And he plays Jombie. Yes. And yep. he's Jombie. Yep. But he being famous for Jombie breaks my heart because he Paragon of Comedy was so fucking funny. Yeah. It's hilarious. I have a copy of it. I'll get you one. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the... Um, the uh, Coop, Coop Boy Report. Yep. We used to do Coop Boy Report. I mean, the fact that Edie McClurg was such a huge part of that yeah. sketch show. Yeah. It, it, that group of the Groundlings. Like, I wore out two tapes of that P.B. Herman special. <laughs> and it, it, at one point, this little convenience store near my grandparents' house used to rent movies. And I rented that every week. And yeah. the guy just gave me the tape. Aww. He's like, you've paid for this. <laughs> like, no one rented it. And I just, I watched it over and over and over and over and over again. And it, it's so funny. And it was everything I liked, like the weird old, you know, is that a big enough piece of cake or what? Like I had the <laughs> yes, whole thing. Yes. And so, yeah, Paragon of Comedy was like still that same sort of humor. And it, it's, no one's ever seen it. He also did another special <gasps> called Disco Beaver from Outer Space. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, the year before, and it's more Groundlings people. And it's not as solid, but there's some really funny stuff in it. Um, and again, the, the early days of HBO and Showtime, where they were just throwing money to people. If yeah. you make it for this amount of money, and it's this long, whatever. Yeah. And we got all kinds of weird stuff. And that Martin Short um, special is still one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Um, and it and it's it's basically like a two-hour episode of SCTV with just him. Yeah. And it's, it's like all his ideas get yeah. through. And it's ugging up and being really weird. And he has Lawrence Orbach trying to be an actor. <laughs> and like the, and there's, there's a scene that should not be funny because it's him and... Um, Christopher Guest just being like these catty gay guys who are talking about their wives. <laughs> and it's on the surface just like really sort of offensive, like you're laughing because of the way they're talking. But they're clearly improving this stuff. Yes. And Martin Short keeps having to take drinks because he's laughing. And at one point, my favorite thing in it, Christopher Guest goes, my son Pendarvis came up to me, which I'm already <laughs> laughing. And he goes, and he asked me, he said, Papa, what's a wood-burning tool? <laughs> and then he goes off on this weird tangent. And then he goes... Never did answer him. And it's just like the weirdest. It makes no sense. It goes nowhere. And it's perfect. It's the same thing as when Christopher Guest was on Saturday Night Live with that. The I don't remember how many seasons he was on. Just one. So that like that uh, Jackie uh, somebody Jr. Oh, Jackie. Yeah. Er Jackie Rogers. Jr. Jackie Rogers. Jr. Yeah, Martin Short is the albino. Yes. Yeah. At the hundred thousand dollar jackpot. Yeah. Wad, yeah. Where Christopher Guest is like doing giving those answers. And I don't know if it was based on a real person. Person. I don't know if there was a, a he's cultural being like reference. Indian. Yes, and he's Chaputi. like chocolate babies. Chocolate babies. <laughs> Chaputi. Yeah, yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, there's the shit where you're sitting there going, I bet you this is funny to adults. I don't know what's don't happening, but I like it anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, that that sketch is hilarious. Amazing. Yeah, they, Chaputi. Chaputi. <laughs> or like even the stuff where I'm not a huge Billy Crystal fan, but the thing you do to Christopher Guest with the two Night Watchmen. Yes. That were clearly improv. Yes. And there's one where, um, and they're just talking about like things they do to themselves that hurt. Oh, it premise. hurts so bad. Yeah, yep. smart. But there's one, and I never noticed it until I watched that like SNL 1980s special. And um, Billy Crystal says that Guest improv this thing where he said, I stripped down to the nude. <laughs> and he goes, because he made it a thing. Because he made it a noun, <laughs> I just started laughing because he goes, oh, yeah, and then I stripped down to the nude. And, and, and when I rewatched Billy Crystal, I just can't stop laughing. Mm -hmm. And I normally hate that in a sketch. Yes. But uh, it's so funny because it's such a weird thing. And they were so fun. Every sketch. Yeah. I mean, do you remember the, the um, synchronized swimming sketch? Oh, of course. Yeah. It's like. I don't swim. <laughs> it's <laughs> so yeah. crazy. It's so crazy. And it's so. Um, it's so high level. Like I feel like they on those they were giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, they. And they I mean, SCTV is my favorite sketch show ever. Um, and the last season they did for Cinemax, which is the season right before Martin Short went to H uh, to SNL, he's doing just weird stuff and a lot of characters he took to SNL. Yeah, and that same character from the the. Um, the synchronized swimming one is Lawrence Orbach. They do a, a, a Jeopardy thing. And I still laugh at this every time. And uh, Eugene Levy's like, Lawrence uh, says here, you're, you're going back to school, grad school. And he goes, no high school. <laughs> and he goes, Oh, he goes, I'm having some degree of difficulty getting through high school. 
And then he goes, well, I'm going to do it, Alex. And he's just so like, <laughs> and it's the funniest way for us. He goes, hey, what do you want to do? And he goes, and then I'd like to be a circuit court judge. And it's just like that character. And then, then there's uh, Joe Flaherty is this like guy with this weird nose. And he goes, uh, and he goes, oh, says so you're, you're a scientist. No, I lied. <laughs> and he goes, what? He goes, I, I lied. <laughs> and he goes, what do you do for a just Just a job. It's just a job. And it's just so weird and funny. And uh, the, them do, getting to do that stuff on SNL was the best. Yeah. Yeah. Nathan Thurm. Yeah, of course I know. It's my, of course I know. Well, he did the Soren Weiss report on SCTV. Did you ever see that? <laughs> no. It's him and Eugene Levy. And again, they're playing like kind of catty gay guys that have this like commentary show. And they do this thing where they just grade different things. <laughs> so he goes, the royal family. And he's like, I don't like them. B. And so they go over <laughs> and they're just doing like a lightning round. And Eugene Levy goes, acid rain. And all Martin Short goes, he goes, oh, yeah. And then they just go on to the next thing. And it's the funniest, weirdest. Oh, I, love I feel it. like all of those things built to um, Jiminy Glick. Yeah. I feel like he pulled from all of these insane characters. And then Jiminy Glick was like, he loved to wear a fat suit. Yep. But all, but it was impro- improvised, yeah. obviously. And that the kind of things he was figuring out how to say to someone's face... I mean, I've never laughed harder than watching Jiminy Glick. No, and he, he, Martin Short is unfairly, doesn't get enough credit, I think, for how weird and funny and bizarre and the stuff that he got away with and just how much he loves ugging up and yeah. just, just crazy odd characters yeah and like to yeah, but they're Trump. also still slightly realistic yeah. like when he would go like do you think that 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 blah, blah, blah. like yeah. it, there's yeah. something insane about it but then also you know who he's doing yeah you're like this is a real guy like you've created a character yeah um and in all the sctv people were able to do that and i don't you know even even john candy who i love was probably the worst at it um and he still even makes these just weird characters like when he, when he would do uh um Johnny LaRue, who was kind of like a one dimensional character. There's this one scene where he's doing this Johnny LaRue's exercise thing. Yeah. And he goes, A lot of a lot of you women been writing in complaining that I'm gay. <laughs> well I'm not. And then just like moves on. <laughs> but then they like bring reference that later and it builds this world and it's like <laughs> like to make it that people are writing and complaining, like, like it's such a weird uh, like flavor that you've added to this thing. And yes, I, oh, it's I love it. Random, but then not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you've thought this out for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so everybody watch SCTV. <laughs> it's real good. Yep, there's, Very there's talented young murders. people on it. I, I think they're going places. <laughs> that Dave Thomas, everybody. <laughs> he's uh, got something. He's got, he's got that pizzazz. Uh, Catherine O'Hara is a movie star. She's amazing. Canadian, yes. amazing. She's gonna. She's gonna be something. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and it's been great talking. <laughs> We've been to you. talking for nine hours. It's been fourteen hours. <laughs> Yes, it's 2019. No. We did it. It's like a marathon where people aren't giving us money. <laughs> My car's been towed. <laughs> yes, yes. This is insane. But we need to raise money to get it back, everybody. Yes, so, so please, please yes. call in. Call in. Tell us your car. stories. We'll reenact yep. them. You'll get a tote bag. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. There you go. Could have talked to Karen for another eight hours. I don't know if uh, if that would have been okay with her, but I, I certainly would have done that. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. A, we have brand new episodes each and every Wednesday. I don't know. Again, I don't know why I went. Hey, um, this is I'm doing a lot of use guys kind of stuff in this episode, so maybe it uh, infected me here in my intro and outro. Um, I will put up links to all Karen stuff, but you most likely already listened to my favorite murder at the very least. Uh, and if you don't, you should because it's very very good. Uh, in addition, I will be at Denver Comic Con uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, so go to my website, I can read.com or denvercomiccon.com, uh, and you'll see all the details there. Amazing lineup of guests. Hopefully, have some of them on some TV Guidance Counselor shows in the future. Uh, I'll also bring some TV Guidance Counselor buttons and stuff with me. So if you are there, let me know. Tweet to me at Kenneth W. Reed or at TV Guidance. Let me know, and I'll, I'll try to find you and give you something. Um, and uh, it should be a fun show. Uh, in addition, you you can email me even if you're not going to Denver Comic Con at TV Guidance Counselor gmail.com or at can and I can read.com. You can also go on Facebook, just search TV Guidance Counselor uh, at TV Guidance on Instagram and Twitter. We'll see you again next time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. <laughs> 
what in the fuck happens yeah. when I go to bed?